That'd be nice. Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am for a third year in a row. Woo! Chat Show. Happy anniversary, everybody. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you, sir. Today we are three. Let's try not to shit ourselves. Mm -hmm. See what happened? No promises. Went right to the gutter. No better way to celebrate than, uh, than to do that. Okay. And by the way, what better way to welcome a new sponsor oh. than to open thusly? Fantastic. I'm sure they'll be thrilled. Yes. This podcast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audio books with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including books read by Hollywood stars. For a free audio book of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Hollywood Kevin. I repeat... For your free, yes, our sponsor is giving you a free audio book. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash Hollywood Kevin. We'd love to hear from you and uh, how you enjoyed your free audio book, so let us know about it, won't you? Um, I'm very excited about the, uh, the Audible uh, returning to this uh, fine program. They uh, uh, joined us uh, long ago, and it's nice to have them back. I want to welcome them back. I'll be talking about them again a little later, as uh, I have two live reads to do for the fineaudible.com people. I'll tell you about my experience enjoying their uh, fine literature as heard. <laughs> what would an anniversary be without a buffering gag? I ask you. I can't imagine. Right? Come on. I do love that you never tell our guests ahead of time. <laughs> and so many of them I have watched seem to get... Is he having a stroke? Should I do nothing? <laughs> Should I do nothing? You look a little strokey. You, well... Has been called. Let's be honest. A few times. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very, uh, very excited about this third anniversary. It was three years ago... Uh, that I, I came to visit, and um, uh, our dear friend, <laughs> internet mini mogul jerk Jason Calacanis, the mad Greek, the worst poker player that the world has ever known, <laughs> comes to the house and donks off a couple of grand once a week. God bless him. Um, although we had a victory last week. I'm sorry. It was, I called Nostradamus and said, really? You don't want to give me a heads up? <laughs> That's how rare it was. That's okay. I hit his car on when I drove back in. You sideswiped? Jamie fine. gave his <laughs> Tesla coupe. That's fine. He's got like a little tap. Yeah. yeah. He'll be fine. And people were telling him he has the number one on the four door sedan as it rolls off. He's literally registered number one. Yeah. Someone mm -hmm. said, You got to put that up on blocks. Not that it's not going to work, just, mm -hmm. you know, for historical value. And he said, Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, Anyway, so Jason Calcanis said, uh, sure, you can do a, uh, a live uh, internet talk show here. And unfortunately, we, we began three years ago, and it's completely and utterly taken over my life. And I want to thank uh, all of you out there uh, for making it so. We have one of our very first uh, regular fans with us today to celebrate our third year anniversary. Uh, or so he uh, might not have known when he boarded his plane in, in Scotland a few days ago, or maybe a few weeks ago now. He's been all over the States. Ross Owen, we don't have uh, a camera that we can just... Wait, look at this. We're going to turn a camera on Ross you Owen, ladies and Jews. Pan? Yeah. Okay. The, the ability Hopefully to not pan. not my movies. Yeah, no. <laughs> We're here to pan the entire country of, of Scotland. No. I, like, I especially like the little bleed of light coming through the, uh, the background. That's especially good. Authentic. Welcome, sir. He's, you're not Mike, so we'll just wave to uh, the world as we know it. <laughs> and as you know it, that's Ross Owen. Thank you, Dr. Chen, evil Dr. Chen. Um, Ross was the first um, guy to send in a video Larry King game. In fact, if J-Mac in the outer uh, production wants to uh, pull that up at some point, put, good luck. let me know. Because it's, oh, it's, it's been on the iTunes or the YouTube forever. Yeah, speaking of iTunes, um, I sat here last week and asked you to please write us a review. Uh, I, I launched another podcast called Talk and Walk, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But I realized after getting a whole bunch of quick reviews on Talk and Walk, and I went over to the chat show page on iTunes, and there was only 19 reviews after doing it almost three years, and I said, 
I've clearly not been hassling you to write us some reviews, so yeah. please do. We now have 295. Great. From last week. How many good? Why is that important? I'm just curious. What kind of question is this? I will, you know. Setting us up to fail. Well, I work here. I know how good it is. <laughs> Uh, we had 19. We have 276 new ones. Nice. 271 of which, five star. Well, that's fantastic. Right? The, uh, our audience is great. They listen. They know how to take direction. The other five people, by the way? They can fuck off. Yeah. They can sit down to a big steamy bowl of fuck, as far as I'm Honestly. concerned. <laughs> why, why when they get, get a second. Why even get up in the morning? I don't mean now. If you're going to be all negative about it. Why do you have the it? time? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for all those reviews. That was a, a very prompt response and wildly appreciated when I went surfing and, and, and found that, that, um, that you were there for us once again. And uh, the show just isn't possible without you. Uh, literally, uh, every week as we get ready to come to the show, Jamie says, really? Again? We have to? Is there any way for us not to Look, do this? That only came up this, uh, today. Oh, really? Today's the only day? Well, it, well you know, to your face. <laughs> yeah, this morning. When are we going to stop this? She asked. Yeah. After today with Mia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good After our show today, our guest says... It's a, it's a strong way to close. i got to be honest. It is a great way to close. Put in the three years, although we got to put in four years to be vested as an owner of thisweekend.com. I have to oh, put in four oh, years. Bitch. The fuckers got me for four years. <sighs> I mean, you know, it's if I want to collect my $14 in retirement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, Jamie, before we get to Sam's a week away, he missed last week's show. We're going to hear why. Uh, you have any news to report from our last show? I know you're excited beyond belief for the return of oh. This Week in Mad Men. I am. It will not I be. I, gonna, I know. I thought it was going to start up to, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, but it'll be a week from tomorrow because my fearless leader, Lon Harris, did not... Uh, <laughs> Secure the studio space in time. Yeah. So. That son of a bitch. Hawkstein. Shh. Oh. That's a secret. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Don't reveal his real name. Um, yeah, so to. a week from tomorrow, go to thisweekend.com slash madmen or thisweekendmadmen.com. No, it couldn't be. No, it's on this week. I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'll tweet it. Everyone will see it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll problem. retweet it. Yeah, it'll be fine. And then the other. <laughs> a well oiled machine, you guys. Yeah. I know. We're I think it's this weekend, uh, thisweekend.com slash Madman. Pretty sure. I think so. Uh, you'll see it on the iTunes immediately. It did very well uh, a year and a half ago when Mad Men was on. <laughs> it's almost been two years. 18 months? 18 months. That's crazy. A year and a half. So those of us who give a shit, that's a, a, br a pretty big deal. And we're awfully excited about it. So good luck with that. And you're having a little screening party little at the house. I'm party. feeding our friends, our, our freeloader friends again. There's only like 12 of us. <laughs> <laughs> only 12 will dine like kings. There'll be bourbon and pot roast for all. Yeah, it's Mad Men theme, so bring your yes. cigarettes and I, I sit out on the pipe. deck with J-Mac. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> with my pipe. Sammy, we missed you horribly last week, I, but I loved why you weren't here. You were starring, co-starring, in a television pilot for the NBC Network. The National Broadcasting Company, that's uh -huh. correct. They're still in the business. They are. Technically. They are. They're still a thing. And it's a hospital-themed show. It is a medical drama. How well-timed for today's guest, who maybe put in a little time on an NBC. It was NBC. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely Very right. Very good, absolutely sir. Right. Hugely successful. So he successful. can tell me how it works. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Hospital-themed show uh, on the NBC. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's great. The, the name of the uh, project is Do No Harm. Would have been very funny if you said St. Elsewhere. It would have been. <laughs> Just saying. We, the, Do the No Harm? The is, is St. Elsewhere, St. Elsewhere 2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because if, a nice it, if it ain't broke. That's a nice cube joint. Uh, uh, Do No Harm? Do No Harm Do from no harm. the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and uh, it stars the uh, fantastic Stephen Pasquale. Sure. Uh, and uh, Felicia Rashad. Hello. And uh, wonderful cast. Sexy Mrs. Huxtable. Very sexy. She doesn't age. No. She looks amazing. She does. Well, uh, as our neighbor pointed out. Yeah. Um, and uh, John uh, Lynch. The, the, uh, John Carroll Lynch. Yeah. Is also. Uh, Love him. In the ca fantastic. Fantastic. cast. Uh, great. Such a good script. Uh, I really, uh, fingers crossed, love to be a part of this thing. 80% uh, of pilots made fail. You're going to squeak through. I look forward to visiting you on set for fantastic. my uh, guest star role first season. I can't wait. Can't wait. Yeah, I'll be pushing for that. Crazy doctor comes in. Insane. From Pittsburgh. Yeah. Because the show's set in Philadelphia, right? Right. Yeah. 
Uh, well, good luck with that, man. Thanks, buddy. You'll find out soon. Uh, yeah, I should know in May. And I don't know, I haven't seen last week's episode of, of the chat show. You I haven't? Don't, I don't know what was said in my absence, but I got a lot of tweets this week saying, is Sam quitting the chat show? Why hasn't Sam been there? I missed one episode. Uh -huh. One episode. What was said in my absence well, here's, here's that the, led people to believe here, I was gone? I will let you know that Antoon did not speak up very much. Well, what a waste. Yeah. Jason Antoon sat in your chair. He it, sat and played a, just to prove the Jews and Arabs can get along. Played a game on his iPhone like the whole time. Yeah. What the hell, man? Yeah. He's totally. He didn't even shame phone on it him. In. Terrible. He phoned it. I'm in. calling you out, Antoon. He phoned it. In. <laughs> Antoon oh, played Bike Baron for two hours. He did. Yeah. That's what I'm James actually wrote. Drew Carey is the guest. He <laughs> Drew Carey is our lovely guest. To, to get in there. And uh, well, yeah. But, uh, no, what was said in your absence was an explanation. Uh, we were in Philadelphia shooting a television pilot. Uh, Remember I mentioned we had 276 new reviews come to the iTunes page for the chat show? So we had a lot of new Those reviews. are the smart fans of the yeah. show. Uh. The people who tweeted you, not so smart. I guess not. Because we did not mislead. No. Um, at all. But for what it's worth, happy to be here. So welcome happy back. You back. were missed terribly. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Talkin' Walkin' um, is a, a comedy podcast. I just recorded another one uh, yesterday. I'm going to uh, hopefully load it up. There you go. There's the TalkinWalkin.com website. It's uh, my dinner with Andre, only I speak only as Christopher Walken for an hour, rambling with a friend about absolutely nothing. Yeah, and it's wow. the most absurd thing you've ever heard. We uh, raced up the charts on iTunes, uh, reaching number three at one point in the top ten comedy podcasts. Um, you can subscribe at iTunes, you can subscribe on the page, write us a review, so on and so forth. We'd love to, I would love to know what you think of the show. Write to us at contact at talkandwalking.com or write to us here, as always, contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Speaking of which, we ask you to, to participate in the show for three years now. Please be a part of this experience. One of you is now here today from uh, Scotland. You know what I'm saying? We ask you now to participate in Ask Kevin, How Do I Do the Show, and also the Larry King Game. First up, I believe we have uh, a gentleman, Dave Gesk, G-E-S-K-E, Gesk. He's offered up an Ask Kevin and a How Do I Do the Chat Show all in Ask one. Ask Kevin. So there's a little graphic for the Ask Kevin. We don't have one, I don't think, for the How Do I Do the. But here we go. This gentleman got both. First of all, big fan. How Do I Do the Kevin Pollock's Chat Show? I was a little late to get to the game, so I purchased the first couple of seasons on the iTunes. It was, was so worth it, and thanks for free travel mug for my non-troubles. We charged for uh, a, a, about a month. We don't need to revisit the past. The fans said, how dare you? Go fuck yourself. Yep. We took it off, the charging. It's been free ever since. And then I sent the travel mug to everyone who, who paid for so it as we, a way to say thank so you. This is one of our one of And our he suckers. sang thanks for the travel mug for my non-troubles. Wow. He was happy to pay. Good for him. I used the, to download the videos of the Kevin Pollock Chat Show until recently. Now I partake in the chat show via Hulu Plus. Wonderful. I wanted to ask my question, whatever happened to the crew gag? Are we to blame sheer laziness for the lack of crew gags? Or did the blow-up graphic take a shit and you couldn't possibly live with a crew gag without it? Mm. Thank you so much for countless laughs, and I will now sheepishly go fuck myself. Wait, that didn't sound right. From David Gesk, keep up the great work. Um, no crew gag. Do we blame Rotman? Because he used to crack the whip out there. I, uh... Our I own think... Josh Negrin is too busy making films every week. Right. Yeah. He's, he's a busy guy. He, he's not going to... There he is. He's not going to... He's not going to bring his red camera. You know, no. he's got the red now. No. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's certainly going to do that. Cause, yeah. Really? Get the red. Get the red. I wonder if there's any way I could have known that. Hmm. How would um, you have known? How could I have known? I suggest you might have mentioned. I don't have a computer. No. Nope. Uh, our crew is. Uh, I don't want to. This is going to sound wrong. To call them lazy? Well, they're not they're special needs. Hungover? They're a special needs group. Is that what they're calling and hungover like these days? Them. Special needs? They're a special needs group. That needs is sleep and coffee. <laughs> Sorry. What do you say? You're fucking dead, Levine. Oh. <laughs> well, you know it'll he's Krav Maga. That's there. A, that, yeah. He's. It'll be fine. He is Krav Maga. Now. It'll be fine. Or quick draw McGraw, depending on... You keep calling it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how you thought that Krav Maga was made up. Like, <laughs> like it was a made-up term. Well, I still think it. Um, 
Yeah. They've got better things to do. They're filling out job applications, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're all, we're doing just fine. And now uh, from the audience where we met our, uh, our visitor from Scotland, Ross Owen, is a Larry King game. This one offered up by the proud owner of a, a Kevin Pollock Chat Show t-shirt now, which we will send off to James Ryan of Seattle, Washington. Another tie-in to today's guest. You'll soon find out why. He writes, this Larry King game, congratulations on your victory, sir. Here we go. I am very pleased to be returning to the world of broadcasting. Little myth, though, that it's going to be on the internet only. Guess I'll have to get a Twister and a Face Space account. My first guest will be Steve Jobs. Claw, Washington, go. Wait a minute. Where's the phone? <laughs> very nice. Nice. Sure. Sure. <laughs> this week's winner. Um, yes, I, th I believe that is the business. And now to finally get the business out of the way, I will get back to the audible.com. Throw that up to Kenyon, if you will, please. This, this broadcast again, podcast brought to you by audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audio books, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature and featuring audio versions of many New York Times bestsellers. Have you ever visited Harlem with Sam L. Jackson? Traveled the Yellow Brick Road with Anne Hathaway? Have you explored the pangs of youth with Susan Sarandon? Or the pangs of love with Kate Winslet? Mm. All these and more come to you. Are, they are available on Audible. Their A-list collection features Hollywood's finest reading their favorite books. From A Rage in Harlem to The Wonderful Wizard of Oz to The Member of Our Wedding to The Res Rukin. That's a French title of a wonderful opera, I think. Mm. Upcoming performances star Dustin Hoffman, Colin Firth, Nicole Kidman, and many more. From our listeners, Audible is offering... For our listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. For your free audiobook of your choosing, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Hollywood Kevin. Please get yourself one of these free audiobooks, folks, and let us know what you think. Just go to audiopodcast.com slash Hollywood Kevin. I didn't know 100,000 books existed. Well, it's time you found out because you could have one too, Sammy. I'm on it. Yeah. I uh, downloaded uh, Steve Martin's book, Object of Beauty. Hmm. And um, I loved listening to it. You know, it's, it's uh, quite frankly, when you're working out, what, what, what have you, that's how I use it. Who it's read it? It's Steve fantastic. Himself? Yeah. And it's just really great. Um, Albert Brooks' book, 2030, oh. read by me as Albert Brooks, <laughs> if only. That were true. Is it me? I'm nauseous. I'm going to go lie down. Audible.com. Thank you and get yours. Please. Um, it's real easy, by the way, I should point out to go to their site. It's, it's wildly simple to, to maneuver uh, with, your, with your mouse or your cursor or whatever the kids are using these days. I look forward to just looking at it and having it. You control the cursor with your eyes. Sure, that'll in involve implants, but you know what? When it's done at birth, what do you care? Just lenses. They cut the schmeckle, they put in the... <laughs> well... The implants in your eyes. I, I... Why not? Yeah. If you're already there. If you're already there. Since you're down there... While you're down there... I'll say. Um, I uh, am unbelievably thrilled to celebrate this third anniversary with today's guest. Um... I, I, I was a st I started as a standard comedian, as, ma as many of you know, I've bored you to tears with the stories, but I was passing through Seattle, Washington, where we were just speaking. There was a great club called the Comedy Underground at Swanee's. Uh, Swanee was a catcher for the Seattle Mariners, and he opened himself up a bar. A baseball player who opened up a bar. You could, put a, you could base a show on that, a TV show. Wait a minute. And... Uh, as Swanee was uh, often behind the bar, not serving drinks, just passed out. <laughs> but there was a club downstairs called the Comedy Underground. So I, I, I uh, do my show. I think I, we met after the show, but there's a ch he'll correct me if, if, if need be. 
And um, I meet a television star who, at that point, co-starring in The Saint Elsewhere, Mr. Red Begley Jr. And I am absolutely tickled, devoted fan of the show, watch every week. Um, wondering if this Denzel Washington kid's career will ever start. And, uh, oh, it's nice to see Howie Mandel without the... The glove. On his head. Huh. Devoted to the show and love the show. And I'm, I'm meeting a uh, television star, and I'm unbelievably thrilled. Hadn't met many at all at that point in my life. A about a year away from moving to L.A. at that point. Still residing in the San Francisco. Ed Begley Jr. turns out to be the nicest guy ever. Says, listen, uh, you, you, I totally respect what you do up there, and so on and so forth. Also... If you ever should come to Los Angeles, be happy to, uh, to meet you there. You know, have a coffee or whatever. I take it to heart. I look him up, uh, I don't know how many months later, and he says, let's meet at the, oh, I think the center of the universe, but that's not what it's called. Oh, um, on uh, Hollywood. Yes. Uh, um, something of the world. Yes. Crossroads of the World. Crossroads of the World. There it is. He said, meet me there. I'd never heard of the place. I thought I was the North by Northwest and was being taken there to be killed. And um, it was so amazing. And um, uh, I, it stuck with me. And I always remembered uh, the difference that one person can make for uh, the kid uh, just arriving on the turnip truck. And I've been f forever grateful and have tried to pay it forward uh, a few times. Um, and I'm just delighted to share our, our third anniversary with the, the utter delightful and Begley Jr. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Um, crossroads of uh, I, I'm sure world. we did meet there originally, but I hope you also remember you came by the set subsequent to that. Yes, sir. Yes, you did. The first meeting was there for coffee or yeah. lunch yeah. or something. Yeah. And the other thing, by way of humility, you're saying, I, I said, I respect what you do afterwards. It was more rave kind of you killed, which you did, as you always do. Rave, rave stuff. You, you did kill that night, and I was an instant fan and have been ever since. Well, it's very kind of you to say, and uh, I know that you mean it because you're uh, extremely sincere, but what I found or as by way of segue, what I found uh, it, quite interesting in, in doing the research that JMAC does and, and forwards to me, and I read through 58 pages to get to these pages that sit before me. You yourself did the stand-up comedy for uh, eight or so years. Yes. Around uh, the States, a little bit of uh, touring. You played Max's Kansas City. Very good. The Bottom Line. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's Not a, just a troubadour a here in town. research team. That's all true. I don't know that existed out there, that information. I started in uh, the very late 70s. So you must have got started shortly before that. 69. I had a comedy partner by the name of one Michael Richards. The? The Michael Richards. Right. Yeah. And you guys were Richards and Begley? We were no. Vladimir and Estragon. You I'll know? say. Yeah. We had seen Godot, and so we thought, hey, there, there's some good names. Right put on funny costumes, did improv. We thought we had invented improv. You know, sure. we, hadn't, we didn't know there was a Viola Spolin or a book or a second city, a right. bunch of idiots. But uh, we were kind of funny. We did very well at a hoot night and Doug Weston wanted to manage us and wound up not doing that. And he went off and joined the army. So I started doing a single in Boulder, Colorado, won a talent night and then went around colleges, clubs and concerts, the Ice House, the Troubadour, Bottom Line, Max's Kansas City, Beggar's Banquet in Louisville, Kentucky. What was Max's Kansas City? It was before my time, so it was a uh, a restaurant that also had on stage. They'd have, um, oh gosh, they had uh, Linda Hopkins. They had the Manhattan Manhattan Transfer. Sure. And then I did concerts. I opened for Loggins and Messina and John Sebastian and Poco. Seventies, you know, big acts. Eighteen thousand people at Nassau Coliseum. I would do those venues as well. And when you became a single, as they call it in the trade. You were uh, doing sketches as well, or just drift into banal? I was one of those horrible, and I'm not sure I, uh, I, I like that I have to admit this, but it's true. I was one of those prop comics. You know, I couldn't rely on my words and whatever talents I thought I had or didn't have, so I had all kinds of props. I had a, you know, cereal box and a thing for all these different TV spoofs that I did. I came out, the opening bit was in a cop outfit. I came out in an LAPD uniform. Did you? Yeah, did that and did a bunch of drug jokes, and in the 70s, that played very well. Sure. <laughs> did very, very well. Well. Did, was the cop offering to, to sell some weed? or He came out there was like, you know, I want to talk to you kids about some of the problems in the communities, uh, you know, and on and on. And it was a guy that was, you know, completely out of it. And pretty soon some people would be very upset because they thought it was a real cop because it was a real LAPD uniform. Indeed, I got arrested. Many actors in my group couldn't get arrested back in the 70s. I literally got arrested for impersonating an officer. Went to county jail. No. County jail. Three days in county. 
Three days? Three days, because it's a weekend. Back then, this before they had ATMs, so <laughs> I didn't know anybody had $500. Impersonating an officer is a very serious beef. From on stage, you impersonated? No, no. I was, I was at the Troubadour. I played a club on Reseda Boulevard in the Valley. I went to the Troubadour trying to do a guest thing or something. You know, I was pretty loaded back in those days. Uh -huh. And so uh, I was walking to my car, and I'd taken the badge off. I figured I looked like a Texaco dealer. You know, I figured I just, you know, had uh, nothing uniform on. But no, it had little patches that said Los Angeles police department on the thing because I bought a real LAPD uniform and they came and they said no you're impersonating an officer the sheriff's department is who came and busted me because uh -huh. back then there was no West Hollywood is LA County and they took me away and uh, I spent three days until I went before a judge and said you know it's the same as Adam 12 I'm just on stage with it I'm playing a part you can't arrest Kent McCord and Marty Milner can you give me a break and the judge threw it out and they gave me my uniform back Nice. Yeah. They gave you back the uniform. Yeah, but that was the thing. I did drug, and I had a hippie guy came out with an IV in my arm, like a drug humor of the, you know, a rock musician. I had a nun's habit I put on, and I had all kinds of crazy TV spoof stuff. Right. So who was inspiring you at the time? Uh, were you were you seeing other acts? I mean, who? Steve Martin was playing a lot of the same clubs. The Exit Inn and... Uh, I think that was in Nashville. I was playing there, and he had done a concert at a college there, so we'd see each other. And then Steve was, uh, and Albert, you know, Albert was my hero, as was Steve, and I still know and see them. Great, you know, great comedians. And Richard Pryor was, you know, start, you know, working and starting to find his voice. You know, he was doing, you know, kind of Bill Cosby's act for a while there until he found his voice. Uh, a few years later. Well, but he and uh, Carlin both started out what they say extremely straight-laced and right. very strict sort of monologist until they found their voice. Yeah, the, the wacky weatherman, George Carlin stuff, the right. hippy-dippy weatherman, I, I should yeah. say, and all that stuff. Big George Carlin fan. And I loved all the old guys, you know, the Milton Berle guys and all those guys that have been around so long. I was a big fan of Rickles. You know, I still see Don from time to time, a big fan of his, so I love that school. My dad used to take me to a place called the Hollywood Comedy Club oh my. in the 60s. It was on Highland, that American Legion Hall, right near the Hollywood Bowl. It's still there, the building, but they long ago gave up the Hollywood Comedy Club, and I literally got to meet guys who were one of the Keystone Cops. Oh, my. I met these comedy, and oh, Burt Wheeler from Wheeler and Woolsey, you know, those kind of guys. How old are you at this point? Uh, at this point, I'm 15. Right. And so I'm meeting these comedy legends Literally. from stand-up from vaudeville, and it was, uh, it was great. And I wanted to be a comedian, but I didn't have the discipline, and I started doing it for a while. It was a prop comic, and then when, you know, uh, acting called, and, uh, you know, I just I walked away from that with, a, you know, with ease because it was such hard work doing what you do and what others do who stayed with it and then went on and conquered as acting as well. So were you, uh, how, what kind of uh, uh, discipline did you have in terms of writing new bits and, and material? Very undisciplined. I, I would write, you know, once in a blue moon. And I really, the reason all this happened, besides having a duo with Michael, who was very funny back then as well, I, uh, I was a big fan of the National Lampoon. And sure. I started just kind of doing what they did, you know, satire things and TV spoofs and stuff like that and film spoofs. And I, I, I tried to emulate you know, uh, Michael O'Donoghue and Tony Hendra and all those people mm -hmm. and P.J. O'Rourke and all those funny people at the Lampoon. I just was, I watched, uh, I read every uh, magazine cover to cover and uh, tried to do some of the stuff they were doing and not near as good. I had no discipline for writing whatsoever, none. Um, Personality-wise, you and Michael seem like an interesting combination. Uh, uh, how, did you do road work together or just No, we just started at the Troubadour and right. made a big splash at first, and we decided not to sign this contract with Doug Weston, the Troubadour, because it basically, you know, took a percentage of everything. If we worked at a car wash, he would get a percentage of it. And so we didn't sign that, and so our act kind of faltered, and he went in the military. So, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I wanted to work as an actor. I wasn't getting the kind of parts I wanted. So, but my problem with Michael was he was so goddamn funny. He's such a great physical comedian right. that I would regularly be facing upstage and kind of rocking like this and coming back and trying to get back in character because <laughs> he was very, very funny and very skilled with physical comedy even back then. Absurdly skilled. Yeah. Yeah.
Kramer, you know, all the stuff he does. It's like uh, he, would, he had a great talent when I met him in 1968 at Valley College, and then he cultivated. He watched Paul Parrott movies and Charlie Chase, you know, uh, same person, uh, Charlie Chaplin movies, and watched these Buster Keaton things and cultivated it, the phys you know, the physical comedy that those masters did and, uh, and, and worked and, and honed his craft. So by the time he got Kramer on Seinfeld, right. he was ready to do anything. He'd put in his 10,000 hours. Boy, did he ever. Yeah. Yes, the 10,000 hours hours exactly um how old are you when you realize that your dad is uh in show business i was probably about because i'm always curious yeah. when that becomes a part of the wait a minute your dad doesn't go down to the studio yeah. kind of thing that's it i was five or six when i started to become aware of it what he did and probably 10 or something like it when I realized other people's parents didn't do that because mm -hmm. there was a lot of show business people around. We used to go and visit this couple in Santa Barbara when we drive up north. We're going to San Francisco's dad. How much longer are we going to be here? This boring old couple, Bella and, uh, 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 and uh, oh boy, this is uh, Paul. Paul and Bella were their names. And so when we, can we get out of here? I would sometimes even say, no, well, I got to talk to him a little longer. He was an actor, apparently. It was Paul Muni. Oh my. <laughs> the great Paul Muni. And I'm like around greatness. I'm, you know, yeah. getting more talented possibly by just touching his hand. And uh, so we were, you know, we had those kinds of, my dad had those kinds of friendships. But then he had a lot of normal friends, you know, in the valley. People were ex, you know, factory workers. He worked at a factory when he started to make it as a radio personality in Hartford. So he had those normal friends too, I guess. Right. Um, and would you go visit him on sets of things? And All the time. I begged to go on every set. Did and you? he would uh, allow it. I begged to go with him, you know, when he'd open a show in uh, Boston or in uh, New Haven or in, go to D.C. on the road with advice and consent or with um, uh, Look Homeward Angel. At that stage, uh, uh, what was the, the big play he did with Muni? Uh, Inherit the Wind. I oh was too boy. young. I visited backstage in New York with that right. and met Tony Randall and them and met Muni there, but I didn't ever see the play. He figured I was too young to see it. But by the time I was 10 or 11, he was doing those other plays. I started to go with him and I fell in love with the theater and fell in love with movie sets when I'd visit him on those sets too. And uh, I wanted to do it from the earliest stage. How old are you when he wins the Oscar of Sweet Bird? I was 12. Sweet Bird of Youth? Yeah, I was, wait a minute, was I 12 or 13? Yeah, I was 12, not quite 13. Well, it's 1962 that he wins the award, so maybe he did the movie in 61. Yeah, and, uh, and I, uh, I was in military school in Niagara Falls, and uh, they uh, didn't even let me stay up late to watch it. But the next morning, the commandant got a phone call, and so the press wanted to come and talk to me about something, and you better be careful talking to the press, young man, said the commandant. And what's going on? <laughs> well, your father's won the Oscar, and I kind of heard from this uh, Niagara Falls Gazette or something that my dad had won an Oscar. It was pretty great. Yeah, pretty fantastic. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, you know, as a character actor, you probably don't have a thing where you're out in restaurants and he's constantly being stopped. It happens. Right. Approached by strangers. That's always a question for me as a, as a kid. I wondered, you know, when you see the public uh, approach your father and, and, you know, showing affection and whatnot, total strangers, in other, right. in other words, uh, how odd that first, those first experiences it was, are. He was fortunate enough, as you suggest, that he was a character actor, not a big star, so he had a fairly normal life. People would come up regularly to him, but not so much he couldn't go get a sandwich or go to the market and shop or you know, uh, do any of those things. So, and I've been lucky enough to have that kind of career myself where I, you know, I don't ha I don't need a security detail. Clearly I'm riding the bus here and, you know, going uh, to market or anywhere without any trouble. So uh, he had that. I, I think I would have been a plumber if he had been a plumber. I really do. I want to do what my dad did. Mm -hmm. He was a big influence on me. So uh, <clears throat> I'm glad he was an actor because I've been very successful, you know, for 45 years and uh, still doing it. So I'm, I'm just grateful that he, uh, though he never got me a job, he helped me in so many ways I didn't appreciate at the time. I, I was kind of upset with him, to be honest. Why don't you just get me a gun smoke, Dad? Call up and get me a Perry Mason. How old are you? I'm like 10 and 11 and then 12 and 13. What's the problem here? You know, wake me when I'm famous. Come on, I want a gig, Dad. And he, of course, knew that w I wouldn't appreciate it if he did that. Maybe so that's how you ended up in military school. 
Maybe. With that kind of mouth. I think so. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> why. And many kids my age, when they went to military school, you know, I was 12 and then 13, uh, didn't like it. I loved it. Marching in a circle in the snow with a wooden gun, that's, that wasn't punishment. I kind of, I liked the whole thing, the Class A uniform and the Class B uniform. I kind of, I liked it. It was a, a good time for me there in Niagara Falls. So, and then I went back to California where I was born and, uh, uh, and then I wound up I, living at home again and, uh, and I just kept begging my dad to go out on calls and I did. I kept going out on interviews and I never got anything. Why? Because I had no training. Right. Imagine going to your father, if your father is a plumber, Dad, I want to be a plumber today. Can yeah. I ride in the truck with you and kind of do, what do you do? You kind of put the pipes together, right? <laughs> you know? And I, I never trained, but I finally trained at age 16 and took some classes that my dad helped me get those classes, of course, and he paid for it. Uh, then I got a job within that next year. Right. Uh, on My Three Sons. My Three Sons, your debut. That's right. Your television debut. Yeah. I like that a whole bunch. It was a good show, it was a show I liked a lot, but I had that delusion still, because I got the job and I literally was waiting by the phone after the show aired, thinking, I got my SAG card and the show was just on last night. Let's go. Here comes show business. Here comes show business. That phone's going to ring. And of course, nothing happened. And right. I decided, How long before you get an agent? I hadn't, I, no, I didn't have an agent then. I think some friend of my dad's did it for me. Right. I got an agent probably within a year of that, went out on stuff and got very, very little. But then I started to work as a cameraman, an assistant cameraman, because I just wanted to work in the business. Right. And so I did that and made it a living at that until probably about 1970, uh, acting started to pick up to the point where I gave up the camera work and just worked as an actor. Right. Um, years later, speaking of the camera work, you directed something. I did. I directed a couple of NYPD Blue. And you started on the NYPD Blue, and then uh, there was some movie, I thought. Where is that? Here it is. Um, oh, no. There. A play. I directed a play that a I wrote. A play that you wrote, Caesar and Reuben. Correct. But I, but I thought there was something. I could have sworn I wrote it down. Damn you. Hold on. I don't, I don't think I ever did a movie. Well, then, then I, I love that... Uh, Within the research, within the exhaustive research, there are certain things that are still wrong. That makes me happy, too. That's that Jewel Thief movie, right? That's right. <laughs> it was a great flick. There was an, uh, it, it's actually much. under your sort of um, listing of uh, uh, work in film as a crew member. So whether... Oh. So there was something in 1999, Enemies of Laughter. Enemies of Laughter. I was set to direct that, and I did not direct it. Uh -huh. Very good. My uh -huh. good friend Glenn Merzer wrote that, a very funny guy by the name of Glenn Merzer. I just did a stage reading for him of one of script he wrote. That's right, yeah. of course. Yeah. And uh, Glenn wrote that, and I was set to direct it, but did not. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. You see? Very good. <laughs> Better reason. I couldn't even remember. I directed a movie. Now, when the phone starts ringing and you start to go out on these things, you, you start to find yourself in what has become sort of kitsch, television classics oh, yes. like Mannix and Ironside and Beretta yes. and um, eventually, of course, Love Boat and Quincy, Charlie's Angels, Starsky and Hutch, Barnaby Jones. Yeah. I mean, at the time, you're just going from show to show, but looking, right. looking back on it, you know, I thought that was pretty spectacular to be a part of that, that era. I mean, you're, you're a kid. I was. I was very young. I was in my 20s doing a lot of those shows, doing Mannix and Adam 12 at age 22, and those were big hit shows, you know? Gigantic. My Three Sons, at first job, was a hit show, and it was, you know, I had small parts, of course. Did you I, tell your friends and guys that you were hanging out with? Oh, yeah. I would, you know, tell all the other friends and actors to, you know, feel more important, you know, that I'm working on, uh, you know, some big show, uh, Adam 12. It was a huge show, and... Uh, it w and the money was good for a single guy. I didn't have a family then, and so whatever you made, I was, you know, kind of a, a fortunate young man to be making that money. I mean, I was making SAG scale, don't get me wrong, but as a single man living in a place that I was sharing with another guy, with a roommate, I, you know, it was a very, you know, I could, I could eat out occasionally. It was a, it was a good life. Right. Yeah, very you, good life. You were on your own pretty early. I was. And I kept doing it and doing these small parts. And then by 1982, I'd, I got married in 1976. I had two kids in 77 and 79. And now I've got a young family. I bought a house. And then things started to slow down right after I bought the house. 
and now we get to like 82, and I've been 15 years in the business, and I say to my wife, I say, you know what? We should leave LA. We gotta leave LA, because if I can't make this work, right. and it really become successful, I'm still doing you know, like day player things, after 15 years in any business, I don't care if you're a doctor, a lawyer, selling aluminum siding, whatever it is, after a decade and a half, you gotta shake it up. Let's move to Atlanta, I said. We'll move to Atlanta, I'll be a big fish in a small pond maybe, I'll try to get a talk show there, I'll start as a weatherman or whatever, they'll have me, and then, because I know all these rock musicians that I sure. used to open for, sure. I know actors, when they come into Atlanta, I'll have them on my talk show. Right. That was my idea. Not a bad idea, not a crazy idea, but you know, I was going to do that. And ring, what's this? What? Well, when? Tomorrow? What, what's the St. Elsewhere? What, what does that even mean, St. Elsewhere? Okay, no, I'll go ahead and read for it. And uh, we, were, we put the house on the market. We listed it. We were ready to move out. I had one last interview for St. Elsewhere, and I didn't get it. I didn't get the part of Dr. Peter White that Terrence Knox played. Right. So they threw me a bone, Mark Tinker liked me, and maybe Bruce Paltrow liked me. They had me play this guy, Ehrlich, and they combined him with another guy, Stanton, and I had one scene in which I was talking to myself. Stanton was talking to Ehrlich. They kind of combined it, and I so I had an episode. Then they said, we want you to do three episodes. I was out of my mind with glee that I had three. Then they said six. Had you sold the house already? No, I got, took it off as soon as I got the interview. Right. I, I stopped all that, <laughs> you know, because I was sure I was going to get it. Right. And then I didn't, but then in a way I did. I did better than the regular part I was going for. And then they discovered that thing with Bill Daniels and me, the kind of Mutt and Jeff thing with yes. William Daniels. Yes. Because he's shorter than I and the goofy guy from California, the surgeon, and they liked it and they wrote for it. And six years later, you know, it was a great job. Um, yeah, I don't remember Terrence Knox getting six Emmy nominations. That's correct. I got very lucky and got six Emmy nominations. Always Golden a Golden Globe made. nomination That's right. as well. Always I, a I don't remember Terry Knox bride. pulling in that kind of no, accolades. He didn't. No, he didn't. For the Peter White. He was a, a wonderful actor. No, for show. sure. Please. I'm not but, taking anything away. I'm just saying you uh, made uh, an incredible booyah base with the sardine you were originally <laughs> given, <laughs> is what I suggest to you, Thank sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, so all right. So I mentioned the Denzel on the set. Is there, uh, I mean, I've worked with the guy. He was already a star, but he, he has a certain charm and magnetism that I imagine even then was beyond palpable very clear that he was a star. I'd seen him in Carbon Copy mm. with George Siegel and thought he was great in that, and then we were lucky enough to get him on the show, but he wasn't that well known the first season or two of the show, and then Bruce Paltrow gets some of the credit. Him and his agents were wise enough to seek out and get these movies, you know, uh, Glory and, you know, to go after those uh, Cry Freedom kind of movies, mm. and he was so good, he delivered. He was know. still on St. Elsewhere when he, he was did still Glory, on, and, and, right? and, Yes, and, but Bruce Paltrow rewrote episodes as a fake, he didn't have to do this. He said, no, no, you you got a contract, you stay here. He uh, very much rewrote things and made it possible for Denzel to go and do Glory and to go and do Cry Freedom. They did it some somewhat on the hiatus, but there was overlap and things, so they, they uh, took him out of episodes as a favor so he could do that, and boy, did he deliver. From that first movie, it was like, he's a movie star. He told me the, great, the funniest, uh, well, not funny, but kind of brilliant uh, thing on Glory. Uh, they they were uh, Dick and his agent around on the on the salary that they were offering and what his agent was asking, without mentioning numbers. Um, he finally said to his agent, "Well, you know what? Let's take what they're offering, even though it's half. All right, and build in a bonus of the same amount." if I get nominated for an Academy Award, and then double that if I win the Academy Award. And his agent said, oh, I don't know if you want that kind of... No, no. Half of the salary if I get nominated, and double my salary if I win. And the producers, of course, said, absolutely. If that's all it takes to close the deal, sure. Right. And he was nominated and won the Oscar. And, right. And I, I thought, that's one of the best go fuck yourself stories ever. Yeah. Yeah, you want to pay me peanuts? All right. Sure. Here's what I'll do with your peanuts. From that first moment we was there getting beaten and the, that tears going down with his stoic face. Whipped. I mean, go, the staging that Ed Zwick did on the... Oh, boy. You go, this kid's going to the podium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was crystal Brilliant. clear. Yeah. But also, the I, I'd never heard an actor, A, have the sort of... Um, 
gumption. It's beyond where go to Freddie Fields. Freddie Fields is a big producer at this point, a very powerful guy. One That's, of the most powerful. Yeah, for sure. This it, is 80 something. Yeah. And um, a bit cocksure in terms of, of, of contract negotiations. Yeah. But so I asked him, he's one of the only actors I ever worked with who he's the leading man. I'm playing the sidekick. He's the only one that ever called six weeks before we're going to shoot. The only one. And I worked with all the biggest. Made a point of calling him saying, we're playing best friends in this movie. Why don't we go out and have dinner and actually get to know each other? Like six weeks before. Set it up at ACT in San Francisco where I'm from. You know, oh just real salt of the earth kind of stuff. Yeah. Very, very impressive. And so I did ask him about that uh, story. You know, what the hell? Where do, you, where, where do you get off? Yeah. Investing in your future like that. Because he, he said that's what it was. I was investing in myself. You read that script. You read that part. If you have any talent whatsoever, you know. Whoever does this part, by the way it was written. Mm. And I said, well, that, now you're going to serve up humble pie after yeah, all no. those great negotiations? It took someone with his skill set to really pull that off at that level. Right. But I mentioned it because um, w when I was saying that you, you were given, um, you know, a smaller part to start with and, and what, you, what you were able to, to make of it, and eventually, it, I, I disagree that it's just the writing, the same way that you disagree that Denzel tried to suggest that humbly, that it was just, yes, you cannot get to that place without good writing. You cannot step forward and, and create that relationship with, with William Maybe there's Daniels. a little bit of that, but yeah. boy, if, you got, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And yeah. they had those great pages they But wrote nominated them. for an Emmy six times. Yep. The show was on for, what, six years? Six years. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was very nice. It was I mean, it's one thing to be on a successful show. Yeah. And do well for the show. Be a real part of it. But that was a huge cast, and not everyone got nominated. Sadly, no. I mean, there should have been nominations for David Morse and Denzel and those talented people. David I always Morse, felt a little... God, you forget all oh my the God. amazing talent. What an actor. Yeah, Bill Daniels. Uh, Bonnie just... Bartlett. Oh, God. You know, Christina Pickles, good people. Really, really Really so. wonderful actors. Yeah. A special moment in time, for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, first Ed sense Flanders. for you Oof. about being a regular on a show, yeah? Yeah. You've just done the guest star stuff? Yeah, I've never been a regular. I've right. had pilots. They, none of them ever went anywhere. Never had one picked up for three. or so they, they would Back then, they would pick up for 13 or nothing. They didn't do any six or three order pickups back then. So I never had any series ever. And this was my first, you know... I'm going to work on the pilot, and now I've got a second episode, and now they want me to do three and six, and now I'm in all shows produced? What the hell? Yeah, that's a big leap. What did I fall into here? Where did I go right? And I, I th seem to recall it was kind of a, a hit pretty quickly. Well, it was, did a, you struggle it was a critical hit. It was right. never a ratings hit. Right. It was one week and one only in the top ten. Mm. The rest of the times it was, and then it was 14, but it was... Boy, was but they had. Critics, darling. The critics loved it, and it had what they call, uh, what they call, you know this very well, the Q rating. Sure. With the kind of people that watched it was, you know, the white wine spritzer crowd would watch and buy whatever they were selling and the high end kind of stuff, I guess. And so it did very well with those demographics. And right. so, but Brandon Tartikoff was a different kind of network head. Yeah. You know, there were three shows in 1982 in that fall season that were the three lowest shows out of back then, there were 70 shows on network TV. The, the, the third lowest was Cheers, the second lowest was Family Ties, and the very bottom lowest was St. Elsewhere. But Brandon, and importantly, Lily Tartikoff, both loved those three shows. He went, let's just give them a little time. I think people are going to find, boom, Cheers and Family Ties were huge hits, and we were another kind of hit, a critical hit right. and a, you know, hit in you, Those three shows were the bottom three of the 70? The bottom three. Yes. Uh, it, the, I'm sure those records are still available but in 1982. 68, 69, and 70. And 70. There were 70 shows that were <laughs> pulled at that point by Nielsen and Arbitron. We were the three lowest shows. Well, I think the rating system from the beginning has been the, the most ass-backward uh, form yeah. to, to, to judge anything on. I remember b testing a pilot, you know, for the audience, and you're there with the people with the machines, and you're watching through the double glass uh, and um, not double glass they're reflecting um, oh yeah see-through mirror. mirror what mirror. yeah see-through and one-way mirror and you're watching them talk about the show as, as a creator and an executive yeah. producer and you know it, it's important to have those but I said to them as a stand-up comedian 
I can do Friday and Saturday night, two shows a night, four shows in Minneapolis. Same, same room, same venue, four audiences, and get four totally different reactions yes. to several of the routines. Right. You're going to have 11 people in a room who saw a sign that said free soup and air conditioning. Right. Uh, judge the fate and future of this show. You'll live and die by those results. Yeah. Astonishing. That's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and just a system that just seemed to be utterly and completely absurd from the beginning. And then you find shows and stories like this that Family Ties, Cheers, and St. Elsewhere were bottom dwellers. Yeah. Only because the network executive, the president of the network said, let's give them a shot. They wouldn't, as you know now, they don't let you go three episodes. They'll, they'll, the first two, when you're that low, they'll kind of wince and take it. But by the third episode, and I've had this happen fairly recently, third episode, gone, done. They don't forget, they won't last, they won't wait six. Right. Um, all right, let's, uh, th there was something uh, I wanted to ask about you. As a young film fan, I latched on to... Um, a comedy film that uh, has resonated throughout my life in so many, many ways. We've talked about it briefly away from the show, but I, if you, if you would, we need to talk about the in-laws oh. and Peter Falk and Alan Arkin, two of my lifelong heroes. Oh boy! Um, you're yeah, and Andy Bergman. I mean, the script. Oh boy. The script was that, that Dick Libertini. It wasn't his directorial debut, Andy Bergman, was it? No, uh, Arthur Hiller directed. Arthur Hiller directed, and yes. Andy came back and did the right Ill the sequel. Yeah, um, oh, Arthur Hiller. I mean, this really was exceptional, a pedigree every which way you turn. Yeah. So for you, how does this uh, experience begin? I was elated beyond words to work with Peter Falk. I um, I think I'd met him already. Yes, I had. I had done an episode of Columbo. Yes, you did. I did an episode of Columbo where I play this dog handler guy. Then I did another one later, but this You did another one later where you played Officer Stein or Officer... That was the one I did in 70, uh, 77, perhaps. We're going to first need to discuss how you and your particular appearance played a character named Officer Stein. Yes. I don't, I, I don't know how I got German that Jew? interview. German Jew? German Jew? I think so. I think that's where they were going. And I had a mustache, and maybe that helped them. I don't know. I was very blonde, and the Teutonic Plague suddenly is playing Stein. I didn't get it. But yeah. I wasn't going to say no to working with Peter Falk or on Columbo. So I played some sort of dog. Oh, I don't know what, I know what happened. William Frawley gave me the job. Is I knew, uh, did I say William? Yeah, the director Frawley. Not, yeah. not William, Jim Frawley. Right. Jim Frawley. Not, not William Frawley, of course. Jim Frawley, the director I knew, and he said, oh, Begley be good for this, you know, and uh, get him. I went in, met with the casting director, and I didn't stumble, so they gave me the part. Right. And then I got to work with Peter Falk. And then and the in-laws were down in Cuernavaca together, and, uh, and then working back here, too, and it was a dream come true. It's, uh, I think, you know, that and Spinal Tap are the two funniest movies I've ever been in, in my life. And right. both, uh, you know, hard to pick, different genre, but uh, brilliant beyond words. The film really holds up. The in-laws. Yeah. It's absurd. <coughs> absurd. It's truly absurd. I just did a, uh, our friend Wayne Fetterman had his first uh, Wayne Fetterman International Film Festival. I perked up. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> Wayne Fetterman and I perked and up. He had a, a, a Gary he's Shandling. He's a handsome Jew. He's a very tall and handsome Jew. Yes. yes. Very funny. We were talking uh, about Jews earlier in the chat Were you room. in the chat room? You were talking yeah. about Jews? Yes. Really? Or Jews? Jews. Oh, Jews. Jewish men. Jewish men. Gotcha. <laughs> tall, handsome ones? We got a lot of big fans of Officer Stein in here. Oh, a lot do we? Of fans. They're going nuts for They're the going uh, nuts for the officer Stein. For the Norwegian Stein. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Wayne Fetterman has his uh, film festival, and he asked a handful of friends to present a film of their choosing. I think Andy Kindler had uh, Modern Romance, which is oh, what you oh boy. went to see. Classic, lifetime classic. Yeah. And I presented The In-Laws just oh. just because it's my favorite comedy of all time. Bless you. And uh, uh, y y your scenes are with both of them at times, not just with Peter, but Alan Arkin as well. I know. Certainly. Alan Arkin. And how palpable is their chemistry on the set between the two of them? Because in the movie, it's astonishing. Yeah, it was very, uh, very evident, quite evident on set what was going on there. The script was so good, I was just uh, amazed and impressed that I got the part. And then what they were doing with it, you know, Alan Arkin's form of 
jazz, you know, interpretation of lines that were funny to begin with, but he plays a little bit off the beat wonderfully in that. And, uh, and then Peter, what he brings to it, uh, just uh, unbelievable, just unbelievable. On the set, I, you know, it was hard to contain myself. And then Dick Libertini's in some of this stuff that I'm doing too, right. doing his senior Wences, Wences stuff is just uh, extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary. Um, yeah, Alan Arkin does have that jazz uh, in his instrument for sure. He does. Yeah. And Peter, would he go off over to the side and... Um... Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right. Could I ask you something? <laughs> would you mind... Let, I want to hear the playback on that last one. I want, back then they didn't have video playback. Right. I got to hear exactly what he said, what I said. And he would listen to the playback. It sounds After exactly you, like it. No, I, no, do, no, no. I got a lot of balls to do that in front of you. <laughs> but you do the best ever. Not, not if you deliver that well. There's no balls <laughs> ne needed, sir. That, well, I mean, you've spent so much time with yes, him. Yes, I'm cheating. I spent a lot. He was a good, good friend. We had the same birthday a few years apart, but September 16th was his birthday and it's mine. So we got to be very good friends after the in-laws and a friendship I cultivated and cherish. But he would Until go... Until his recent passing. Yeah. You, you were still great friends. Yeah, great friends. In fact, we, we ran into each other at uh, Glenn Mercer Reading, and you mentioned that you would bring stuff for... Uh, um, i bring a sandwich over. He liked Art's Deli. The last time he was really uh, fully cognizant of what was going on with me was we had a... a a lunch at Arts Deli about this movie that uh, I was going to help him get made that wound up not getting made. A very funny script. And uh, so, but I remembered he had a, uh, I think he had a uh, corned beef sandwich or something and he loved it. He was looking forward to eating at Arts for that corned beef. So I'd bring him over that sandwich and he loved that sandwich. I bring veggie stuff for Shara and me because we're both a bunch of wacky vegetarians. So we'd eat that stuff and talk to him. And it became apparent that he, he was very friendly to me, but I don't think he knew who I was. And Toward, then I, the towards way he the talked, end, sure. Yeah. I, then it also seemed like he didn't, after the first hello, I wasn't sure he knew who Shara was. But then I'd be talking, then I brought Dabney Coleman once too, because Dabney wanted to say hi, because we were all good friends, we'd eat together often. And then he, uh, Dabney got kind of, uh, got the same reaction. But then at some point, Dabney and I were talking, we decided we wouldn't just constantly be in his face, and we were talking amongst ourselves, and I could see him look over. Those sons of bitches. <laughs> he would, didn't say a word, but those are the guys. That was it at Guido's. We were at fucking Guido's on Santa Monica and Bundy. That, uh, yeah, he didn't say a word, but I could see he totally. And he went, oh, yeah. He said, maybe, oh, yeah. Yes. And it was like, oh, fuck. It was so great. Yeah. Because he was that a haunt for you guys? Because Jamie and I go to Guido's still. Yeah, we would go there. We would go there. Be Dabney and Peter and me and Charles Grodin had come. It's like, oh my God, how did I luck into this to even know these guys? Let alone that they're going to dine with me. Then Peter said, let's get a bunch of guys together. Just a bunch of guys. You invite a bunch of guys. I want to make sure Dabney's there, and he had a couple requests, and then get a bunch of guys. So I got Eric Idle. I got this one and that one, and Harry Dean Stanton. A bunch of people together, and we invite. You know, just a bunch of guys getting together and bullshitting at a table of Guidos. It was like great stuff. I'm, I'm a grateful man that I got to be a part of his life in that way. Yeah, still close uh, in contact with Dabney. Oh, yeah. I talked to Dabney. I was just at his birthday party. He had a wonderful birthday. Oh, nice. And uh, I was there, and a, a lot of his friends were there. It was a great birthday. Did he talk at all of his uh, experience on the Boardwalk Empire? Yes. I, th I love that show, by the way, and I thought he was sensational He's in it. He's brilliant. He's so good. Yeah. He's good in everything. And then they, uh, his daughter Quincy and his son Randy uh, and this guy Drago put together a reel of Dabney Coleman stuff. Oh, my. For the birthday. And I always knew, I'd seen most of it. There's a few things I hadn't seen, shockingly. I'm such a Dabney Coleman fan that I hadn't seen all of it. And it was like, oh my God, I'm just, like at Bruno Kirby's memorial, when we had Bruno's memorial, it was like, oh my, some of that stuff that I hadn't seen, films he had done, I was in the presence of greatness. And, and it's the same with Dabney. Yeah. You know, he's so, so funny and, uh, and every bit is full of But that of part, especially on Boardwalk, where he got to be the very uh, definition of power. Yes. And then as frail as a human could ever be, exactly. be portrayed, all in the same 
a character. And he did that stroke so wonderfully. He did all of it. He's so good. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Uh, we like to bring in the audience whenever possible, Ed. He kind of answered the first question. Okay. So go I'll go to the second one yeah. since we covered the first one. But thank you, Michael Brady, who wrote that question in. This one is from John Schrank. Mike Brady. Hmm? Sorry, the, I just, the, person, the, the first person was Mike Brady. I was like, oh, it's Mike Brady, the architect. Yeah, oh, it is Mike Brady, the architect. <laughs> um, John was in the pool. What's that? And it was cold. <laughs> what? John shrank because he got in the pool. Yeah. And it was oh, cold. Oh, I saw cold. I'm with you. It took very good. Sam, very nice. I'm <laughs> Sam, you picked up a few things working on the TV pilot. Very nice. You brought back some new material. I wish it had been nicer. I had no idea he's got a big <laughs> network thing. I would have been sucking up instead no, of, please. give me a coffee, goddamn it. <laughs> I don't like sugar in it. Barking at the poor guy. I'm no, sorry. Yes. Let's bury the hatchet. Absolutely. Let's start anew. And can Kenny's you, back. Can I call you Eddie Bagels? Yes, you can. Fantastic. Call me whatever the hell you All want. All right. Eddie Bagels. Yeah. Absolutely. Why not? Why not? You ever been called Eddie Bagels? Uh, yes. Uh, really? When Rob Reiner calls me Eddie Bagels. <laughs> so I'm in good company. You're Another, in very good company. All right. Good choice, sir. Thanks well played. If Thanks. you're gonna if you're gonna play tennis with a talented Jew, it might as well be a, a mountain of one at that. This one from John Schrank, who apparently spent too much time in a pool. <laughs> Ed has had the chance to work alongside many real immortals in show business. So this is one we were talking with about a little bit. Um, some from another generation, including having Steve Allen and Jane Meadows play his parents on St. Elsewhere. Yes, what sir. sort of advice might they have passed along? They became good friends, too. I was uh, uh, very friendly with uh, Steve and still friends with Jane. And, uh, you know, uh, they have a son who looks not unlike me. And so it was a really? very... Yeah. Their, their son... Bill was the head of production or something at uh, CBS MTM Studios back in the day. Very nice. Bill Allen and a great guy. And so I, I became friendly with him and with Jane and Steve. And, you know, they made it a point to have as many of those Steve Allen show guys on. They had Louis Nye on. Oh, and they boy. had all of them that they could get. Tom Post and they had everybody on St. Elsewhere because they were big fans. So for me to work with Steve Allen. Because as a kid, I begged my dad to get me very few autographs, but one was Steve Allen, and he delivered. He Is got that me an right? autograph picture of Steve Allen. So now I'm not just work, you know, not just meeting him, but working with him, and he's playing my dad. It was crazy. And he had a little dictaphone, a little thing that was actually a tape before the digital ones. And he would, Ed Begley just told me about a great book by Boyce Rensberger, How the World Works. Is that right, Ed? Yes, good. That looks like a very good book, a book about science. He loves science. And this is this early 80s that he's pulling this. Early thing. 80s. And he was, uh, you know, the charming, erudite, brilliant guy that you would expect him to be in person. Wrote a lot of books himself. Yeah, would, wrote more songs than anybody ever. He would write a song, uh, you know, every five minutes if you wanted him to. Yeah. His, Jane would ask what he wanted for lunch, and he'd write her a song. Exactly. By way of an answer. Yeah. Uh, you've written a couple of books yourself. I've written a couple of green books, uh, you know, books about energy conservation, and they're doing okay. And uh, that's something I've been involved in since 1970 as well. Leave, live Like Ed? Yes. Li uh, yes, I have Living one. with Ed. Uh, yeah, Living Like Ed is one, and the other one is Ed Begley's Guide to Sustainability. Right. Um, when did this start for you, and, and how... I mean, it, it completely and utterly, um, I think, changed the trajectory of, of your life for the better. And people close to you uh, know what the journey's been like. But, but I think there's a lot to be, to be learned and, and um, discovered from your travels. I started in 1970 because I lived in L.A. Mm -hmm. And L.A. was the smog capital of the world. Horrible, choking smog in the 50s and 60s. So by 1970, I wanted to do something. And somebody was saying there's going to be a big Earth Day thing in April and, you know, let's all get together. And then sadly, my dad, my wonderful dad, Ed Begley Sr., died a few days before the first Earth Day. Mm. So I got involved to honor him as much as anything because he was one of those conservatives who liked to conserve. You know, he turned off the lights and turned off the water and saved string and saved tin foil. He was a son of Irish immigrants. He had lived through the Great Depression. So... I went, let me do something. Earth Day's great, but, uh, you know, the old man's gone just a few days now. I think I'll do something, you know, in his honor. So I started recycling and composting, and what happened next I didn't count on. I was actually saving money. Everything that I did on my, you know, uh, very modest budget, because I was a struggling actor back in 1970, right. I had to do on the cheap, and I saved money right away. So I kept doing more. I kept, you know, take that money that I saved, and I bought a little electric car for $950. 
And when I say car, I'm being quite grand. We're talking about a golf cart with a windshield wiper and a horn. You know, it wasn't much of a car. But it was one of the first electric cars in California for certain. How many were around the country at that point? Electric cars had been around since 1910, but they were like a Baker Electric, a fancy kind of car that Henry Ford, Ford's wife drove. This was a Taylor Dunn that really was like a golf cart. It didn't have a steering wheel. It had a tiller. When I bought it for $950, uh, from this guy Dutch in Reseda. He said, you're the only person under 65 that's ever bought one of these. Because <laughs> people buy them from Palm Springs or, you know, Sun City or something. Is this the original it. Rascal? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Rascal Deluxe. Yeah. yeah. And I drove it, you know, around, because I was a guy who was at that point just riding a bike and taking public transportation to get around. So the electric car was a step up. I even took, I went on a date. I took a poor, unfortunate friend of mine on a date with it, Cindy Williams, Shirley from Laverne and Shirley. Sure. She did not grant me a second date after this. Do you think the golf cart had anything to do with it? It was not a Babe Magnet, okay? It was literally, there was a kid going past us on Hot Wheels giving us the finger, you know? It was uh, not a fast car. Gave you the finger because you were in the way? I was in the way. I think I was going a little too slow. It was not much of a car. But uh, it got me around, and on a rainy day, I wouldn't go on the bike. I didn't want to be standing at a bus stop on a rainy day or any day. i just go around. It went about 20 miles an hour, but it got me around the valley, and uh, sometimes I'd even go into, uh, go into Hollywood with it, but that was a real traffic hazard. Going over the Coinga Pass was not something you'd want to do. Going, you know, then 10 miles an hour up the hill up Coinga Pass, and, you know, people are honking at you is not a smart You're idea. not making friends. No, as not it making turns friends out. at all. Yeah. You, you thought it was because of your leaning towards all things green, but it was just no. because of the car I'm was in the way. too fucking slow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the good thing about that that I also learned from the electric car, if I just stayed away from the Coenga Pass, was that it was cheap. It was cheaper to plug it in than it was to buy 1970 gasoline. It was much cheaper to maintain because there's no tune-up or oil change or fan belt or radio, you know, radiator flush or smog check or valve job. You had, I didn't have a lot of expenses. So I, I stuck with that stuff and I just kept doing it and moving up the ladder and then I bought some solar hot water for my house and I got a rain barrel to collect some rainwater and a solar oven. And then after 20 years of doing it, then I bought solar electric, and that was the big ticket item, and, and that's been very good. All that stuff is good because it saves me a ton of dough. <laughs> and, yeah, you keep coming back to that, but... I'm I, cheap, okay? I, I, Can we just say it? I always... I, I always care about the environment. <laughs> I'm just cheap. That's Let's what I was trying it. to get you to say, and thank okay. you for doing it. Sure. Those, that's the magic word. Lower the duck and give the man $100. Thank you so he much. He just said, I don't care about the environment. I'm, I'm just cheap. cheap. I, I so Jack that. Benny should have really been the first green guy. He was very green. <laughs> yeah. Sammy? I was going to say, playing Officer Stein really rubbed off on him. I think it did. <laughs> he instilled the Junus right away when it's a big facet of this character, and I'm going to roll with it. And by the way, I asked Sammy if this was a holdover from last night going around uh, for St. Patty's Day, and he said, no, he wore it in your honor. He wore the I green. I to go green for you The today. wearing of the green. He went just green for you. Very nice. Just I'm very you. impressed. Look, I got a green belt. That's as close as I came. <laughs> um, I've got some lovely filtered water here. Oh, good. Not I'll from a rain barrel, but can I, uh... I... I love a refill. Okay. You need to hydrate when you're in the hot seat like this. But you know, now you high pressure this show. It's true, right? Oh, boy. You've spoken Ooh. all over the world now about this, Ed. I have. Yeah. Tell me about some of the far reaches uh, journeys that you've taken on behalf of uh, a greener life. Well, you know, I'm out there a lot. I'm very busy with it. You know, the Deputants for Peace, the Geodesic Dome Society, the Tofu Guild, very important. Tofu Guild. <laughs> <laughs> You're making these things up. I am making it up. Uh, I, I was just in, um, I was just in uh, Schaumburg, which is basically Chicago. I was there at a green conference there, and I do a lot of that. I have really another career now, which is these speaking engagements. You can go and speak around the country about energy efficiency at these green yeah. shows, and uh, apparently there's a living to be made in that, too. How about that? Yeah, it's We not should bad. coordinate Schaumburg next time, because there's an improv there that I perform at once really? a year. Really? Yeah. Really? We should coordinate. I'll, I'll definitely coordinate with you. I want to <laughs> be there. I want to come see the act. I'll again. bring you up on stage. Please. We'll do, uh, we'll do Peter Falk talking to Peter Falk. <laughs> Dueling Peters. And then uh, I'll come oh, but out. That could get you in trouble if we bill it as Dueling Peters. That could be a problem. Or sell a lot more tickets. Possibly. Depends on how you look at it. 
Um, so have they greeted you on, on other continents in terms of what you're doing here in the States? I've kept it to the States because, again, I'm trying to keep my carbon footprint down and not fly too much. When I have the time, I drive there in an alternative fuel vehicle. I sometimes take Amtrak or I've even taken Greyhound around, you know, to keep the carbon footprint down. But sometimes you've got to be Monday in L.A. and Tuesday in Chicago, and then you get in a plane and you buy a carbon offset for that experience, and you try to mitigate and do the best you can. You want to make sure you walk the walk. You don't want to be showing up in a limo or doing stuff like that. Or if you do, you show up a block away in a limo. Then you have the, the limo driver pull the bike out, then spritz you down with some Avion, and then you pedal the last <laughs> half mile. Right. The last 20 yards. You've learned the tricks. Other. There you go. Yeah, yeah, which is important. It's very important. Well, you've, you've clearly kept a sense of humor about the whole thing. And, and while starting out by insisting it was because you, you could save a buck and you might have been on the cheap, um, at some point, it, it, it becomes a way of life and you're growing your own vegetables and, mm -hmm. and um, it's not just to sustain yourself, but it is about this carbon footprint, isn't it? It is. And uh, you have to joke about it. You have to keep your sense of humor. Or you just uh, lose the, you know, the ability to keep going on with some of the real problems we have. But also difficult to communicate to people. Yeah. The if sense you of get humor. To, if you're too serious about it, people just zone out and they don't want to hear it all the time. Yeah. So the truth is we have made great strides in the environment. We celebrate, you know, uh, the bad news all the time. We talk about that, but we don't often enough celebrate the good news. The air is not dirtier than it was in 1970. It's much, much cleaner. That's e astounding, quite Astounding. Frankly. Even though we have four times the cars from 1970 and millions more people, if we just held the line, went, wow, damn, we're good. We just have the same amount of smog as 1970 with all these new people coming in, new cars, uh, because technology worked. All the stuff we hoped would work did work. Catalytic converters worked. Combined cycle gas turbines to make electricity work, spray paint booths, all the stuff big and small that we did and urged the Air District to do, it works. So what, do we, what do we do about the <clears throat> 451,000, I believe that's the current number, 451,000 leaf blowers? In the greater Los I'm not Angeles a big fan area. of leaf blowers, as you can imagine. That's got to put out ridiculous. A, a lot, especially the older ones were two-stroke. I, th I think they've eliminated those. I'm sorry, there were, th yeah, there are two-cycle engines, which really polluted like crazy, yeah. very noisy. So now they have electric ones available, and those are better. But, you know, I hired a, a gardener. Uh, the only requirement was, you know, will you not use a leaf blower and not use an electric mower? I mean, not use an internal combustion mower either. You know, I have an electric mower right here. Will you use this? And this guy said, not only will I use yours, but I have my own, you know. And then I finally eliminated the need. He doesn't need to mow anything. I got rid of the, the lawn entirely, even on the city property, the parking strip. I got rid of the lawn in 1988 when I moved into this house on my property. But the city property, that kind of little strip there where the cars park, it's called the parkway, I guess. They, for years, made you keep that grass. You couldn't take it out. And so uh, finally, a few years ago, they wised up and encouraged people to do what I did, which is to take it out and put in, you know, drought tolerant stuff. And it looks nice. Plastic. I have plastic. some of that in the backyard. Rochelle wanted a real patch of lawn, so I got some uh, very nice-looking astroturf. It's, you know, uh, yeah, it's not your grandfather's astroturf. It looks pretty good. Yeah, I'll bet it does. Yeah, and it feels like, most people think it, they say, you're a phony. You said you got rid of your lawn. You got a big patch of putting green lawn right there. I said, just go down and touch it. Yeah. It looks like a real lawn. We, we pass a house often uh, to and from our place that uh, the whole front yard is that is that um, high-end AstroTurf. It can look pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, that's too made good. out of plastic. To, it looks too good. It looks too good. That stuff is a plastic, too. What do you do when it finally goes through its whole life? You put in a landfill. So we have one small patch. I'm not, I, I'm not interested in making a whole lawn out of it. I made one small patch, maybe twice the size of this table. Uh, but uh, the rest of it is California Native Plant Society stuff, you know, California Native Plants, drought tolerant stuff, and what little water I need for my fruit trees and my vegetable garden, I get from rainwater. I've got a big cistern underground, so I'm getting my rainwater, uh, you know, collected, and I use that for the plants. Uh, so when you travel around to talk about this stuff, uh, there must be a, a sense of making a difference, and that's got to feel pretty great. It does feel good because for years I've been talking about this stuff, Kellen, uh, Kevin, Kellen, what the hell was that? Oh, Kellen, I'm... hi, from Scotland. <laughs> hi, Kellen is with us. It's a little tip of the hat to our guest. A little tip of the hat. Yeah. That's what I was trying to do. And please get off my case about it. <laughs> but uh, when Listen, I Listen, I was just about to ask you about spies, lies, and naked thighs oh. for CBS. 
So, you know, we're on even turf here. Yeah. With the what a wonderful career I've had, huh? Spies, lies, and naked. And Can we Santa talk with... about how great you were in She Devil for a second, please? You're being very kind. No, no, yeah, not I, very kind. I like that. That movie's a ton of fun. You I know how it's referred to as the highly underrated. Every review. Thank you. That, every recap, it's, and every it's on reminder. A lot. I, always, I always watch it. Like, the it, highly it underrated. Working with one Meryl Streep, how bad is that? You know, working with Roseanne Barr. I mean, it was great. Very. You funny were the scene. male lead. I was. At least we forget. You see, you were a bastard. He was a I woman. I was a very either. bad man. Very <laughs> bad man in that movie. Unlike the real me, who's a real wonderful guy. Um, but uh, yeah, making a difference. Making a difference. Going around the country, people come up to me regularly, and they email and they tweet. And they go, "Hey, I got one of those solar ovens, and I love how the thermometer is right there in the." the pot doesn't tip over and you go, wait a minute, they actually obviously did get one because it's a level of detail you wouldn't know if you were right. just trying to ingratiate yourself right. and on and on. People regularly uh, come up to me and tell me that they've done X, Y, and Z. And before when I was, you know, preaching this stuff, I didn't have as much success, but I have to credit my wife because her in that show, Living With Ed, the reality show that we did, made it more palatable for people. Because right. it became, you know, this kind of Bickerson's routine of her saying, what are you riding a bike to make toast? You know, forget about it. You're wasting <laughs> your time. And then I'm riding the bike, and it's kind of humorous, hopefully, and it's real. It's something I'm not doing just for the camera. I, I do that. I ride the bike with the generator to put electri electricity into the solar batteries. And so, When someone wants a piece of toast, yeah, you get on a bike. The truth is... It's actually just hooked up to the solar batteries. We did a calculation where I rode for a while. That was enough juice to make the toast. Or I could have lit up a light bulb all day or run a computer all day. But it was just to, to make it something more active of toasting the toast. But I can use those uh, kilowatts, all half of them, you know, to do a chore. And so that's what it was. It was a calculation. Well, that show must have been a lot of fun to do. It was fun. Yeah. The Living with Ed was the name of it? Exactly. It was on Planet Green. Yes, before please. That. I just want to applaud our guest for uh, citing the Bickersons as a reference. Not bad. Thank which, you. Uh, which, credit to my mother, had an old audio cassette tape of the Bickersons. I was wondering how my Sam mother. even knew about the Bickersons. Your and mom, too? My mother references the Bickersons uh, quite a bit. Well, you, his father was a, a radio actor as well. Oh, of course. Yeah, of he course. was the first Charlie Chan on radio, actually. Least we I forget. bet you our mothers would get along famously. I think you're right. I think you're I think right. I would. But uh, a staple in my household has always been, you always say I'll do it, but you never will. Do it now. <laughs> Which is from the Bickers. Which is directly from the Bickers. Wow. Nice. Nice. So I just wanted to thank you. For thank you. Thank keeping you. Keeping that in the lexicon. Well, now that Even we've spent some are. time on, uh, on Green Street, <laughs> uh, let's return to some of the funny. You've been doing exceptional work for quite a while now. And Arrested Development, I want to know okay. how much absurd fun you had working on this show. It's coming back, apparently. Um, to Netflix yes. with, Good. New, with new shows. Yes, I'll be a loyal fan. I don't know if they want Stan Sitwell back. If they do, fantastic. How could but you I'll not be, want to welcome back Stan Sitwell? I, I hope they do, but I don't want to push. How you much don't want fun? To push Mitch. Mitch uh, decides these things, and I hope he wants me, but if he doesn't, I'm still a loyal fan. So you get month. a call one day, and you, they want you to be Stan. Get me a call. Uh, I get a call. You know, the agent calls. There's a show, Arrested Development. There's a show, Arrested Development. It's the greatest show on television. You know, Jeffrey Tambor, my dear friend, is on it. Comedy God. They want me to do what? I'll do craft service. Where do I go? And so uh, I show up. <laughs> so it's this guy that has, you know, alopecia, and he's got the wearing the eyebrows and the, the whole thing, and he's bald and wears these different wigs for different, you know, haircut days. And uh, I said, great. Sounds good to me. And, uh, and but uh, Jeffrey Tambor is a bastard. He really is a bastard. He would literally try to in takes come and, you know, the camera's right there and he's like, Ed, let it and try to do his stuff. You know, where you know, he's off I'm sorry, he's where you are right. and he's doing this stuff. He's drifting your focus. He's oh and doing that Jeffrey Tambor look. And I'm I'm usually pretty good. I'm on screen with Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy at the you know at the, the check-in thing of the Christopher Guest movie, whatever they do. And Michael Higgins and Michael McKean. I'm like a marine. I just stand there and take it, whatever they're doing, <laughs> and then just do the thing. Not a crack. Easter Island, you know, nothing. <laughs> and uh, but he starts doing this stuff, and I went. I went sky high. I couldn't take Jeffrey Tambor. He yeah. was too good. He got you. He got me. He yeah. got me good. He's brilliant. Um, well, let's talk about the Christopher Guest movies. You, you, you first show up in Best in Show? Is that the first? Oh, of course you did Spinal Tap. Spinal with Tap. He and Rob and, and Michael and, and Harry. and Right, and, that uh, crowd did that, and they wanted me in this thing that was actually just a promotional 
uh, bit of footage they did that would never be in the movie. It was done kind of this kinescope looking stuff that would be done to help sell the movie to Sir Lou Grade or whoever was going to put up money for it. Right. And so they then they went they came back when they're actually doing the movie and said, you know, that low quality kind of works for the thing. Can you sign a thing and we'll do, you know, a, a deal so we can use it in the movie? I said, absolutely. Yeah. And then the movie was what it was, one of the best movies I've ever been in. There's the in-laws and there's this is Spinal Tap, yeah. two great movies. And then he did, uh, Chris did Waiting for Guffman. I went to the screening of that at the Director's Guild. I went, oh my God, Chris is doing things that are just incredible. And then, then he called upon me to be in the next one after that, Best in Show. And I was like, Chris, I, I don't know how, how you know, uh, to repay you for this. Because uh, I had that decade of the 90s, I'd been in movie jail for about a decade because I'd been in three movies that just didn't do well. And there's a three strikes rule in Hollywood, yes. as you probably know. Sure. Three strikes and I was out. And I could still, I could go or to- Or one Hollywood. Joanna Man. It's, it's three or one, <laughs> depending on which movie you do. Exactly. And I did, uh, you know, I did three movies that did very poorly. And then uh, I could go, I could still work in motion pictures. I could go to Australia and do a movie with a little girl and a kangaroo. Sure. And did. Mm -hmm. I could go to Canada and do a movie with a little girl and a bear. And did. And I had, uh, full disclosure, in the decade of the 90s, I had one week on Batman Forever of studio movie work. And I had uh, one day's work on... Uh, Oh, no, I had six weeks' work on Greedy. On Greedy. Come on! So that's uh, a whole decade, oh, though. Of course. I had six weeks. I had a total of seven weeks' work. Also underrated, the, oh, the Greedy. Criminally Thank underrated. You. Such a great Thank movie. Thank you. Such Michael a, J. Fox. Michael uh, J. Fox. Kirk, Kirk Douglas, Douglas. Phil Hartman. The great Phil oh. Hartman. Our wow. Loss. That, that is He's Jerry Burns. Loss. Jerry, Very good movie. Love Jerry Burns. Yeah. That, that whole cast is. So uh, that's, but that's the whole decade until Chris Guest. Sign me out of movie jail. Sign for my thing. Year 2000. Give me a new suit, you know, and fifty dollars cash. And suddenly I'm in uh, Best in Show, and I start working in movies again. Right. And lots of other things because people love those movies. So Chris Guest uh, breathed new life into my career. Yeah, it ends up being a mighty wind, and um, so, uh, some of these other things we're talking about, like Arrested Development, um, The West Wing, wonderful work there. When you directed a couple of episodes of NYPD, um, how does that start? Because, you know, a, a number of actors go by way of the TV directing, and it's... it's it was not, Mark Tinker. Uh, was it? Mark Tinker was my dear, was and is my dear friend, but he was a very close friend on St. Elsewhere, too. And so he... Uh, he ran the production company that made it? He was the executive, one of the executive producers of the show, uh, you know, was a Stephen Bochco thing, and I know Stephen, too. So Mark had to kind of stand up for me and say, hey, I think Ed could do this. And Stephen would say, okay, but he's got to, like everybody else, observe for a while and be on the set and did. And I became friendly with Bill Clark, too, mm. uh, one of the producers. And I hung out on the set for weeks, and finally Stephen uh, and Mark felt comfortable enough and Bill felt comfortable enough, so they gave me an episode to do. And then even the second one, and I loved doing it. I would like to direct again, but I... Then after that, somehow got very busy as an actor, so I haven't had time to throw my hat in the ring for directing again, but it's something I want to do uh, again when I have the time. It, you get hooked pretty fast. Yeah, you've done it as well. It's well, I only did it quite recently, and it was for a web series that I had created, but just a chance to sit in that seat and, and, and watch everyone play in the sandbox yes. instead of being in there yourself. Uh, it's it's such, fun, isn't it? Such a fun and different perspective. The most fun I've had on a set, perhaps, is directing. I really enjoyed it because I had been a cameraman for years and I'd been an, and have been an actor for years. So you bring those two disciplines together to be a director, and I really loved the visual aspect of it and loved everything about it. I, I will probably do it again. And we mentioned briefly, but we have to get further into this uh, about. Cesar Chavez, Cesar and Ruben, you wrote and directed this musical. Here's how that happened. What the hell? I reluctantly... Who doesn't want to go see a fun-loving musical about Cesar Chavez? It sounds like a bad Saturday Night Live sketch. Not at all. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're being very kind. But I, I was a friend of Cesar Chavez. I had the, the sadness and the honor of carrying his coffin through the streets of Delano when he died. And What? Uh, yeah. Let's back it up a little. Well... There was 30,000 people who showed up, and there was a, a cadre of people who were friends of his, probably 30 of us that took turns. I was one of 30, maybe 35 people that took turns sure. doing it. So I was in that uh, size of a group and very honored to be such. How had you met? Uh, we met over uh, environmental issues, pesticide issues, because I met, I met him one day. 
I was at uh, Pan's there on the way to LAX, this restaurant. I was mm -hmm. getting breakfast, and I'm there about to eat my oatmeal, and this guy gets out of a car, a very modest car. Very modest car is all I'm going to say. Guy gets out, looks exactly like Cesar Chavez. But at this point, he's like, it's the 80s. He's like Jimmy Hoffa, famous kind of. It couldn't be the, the union leader of that size, you know, getting out of this very modest car with just some other guy. He would have a security detail or something. And, sure. But, so but when he walks past me, I go, nobody looks that much like Cesar Chavez. It's him. I go over the, I go over the table and I say, Mr. Chavez, I, I don't want to bother you. I saw you just finished ordering, and I'll leave before you get your food. But I'm a big fan. The great boycott. I did it right away in the 60s. Lettuce boycott. No lechuga. I'm with you. And I've you know, sent some money to, the different, to La Causa. So I just wanted to say hi. And he said, this is so nice of you. What's your name? I recognize you. You're an actor, right? Yeah, Begley. What's your passion? I said, well, I try to do green stuff. My thing is the environment. So that's very good because I care about like the animals too. You're out saving the owls and the whales. But you got to remember the people, huh? He said, the people, you know, with the pesticide issues. I said, good point, you know, exactly, you know. I, and I know about Mario Bravo and all these kids who died in McFarland and Erlemont. I knew some of their names, you know. And he said, you, you know a bit about this. Why don't you help me? Help me with this thing with pesticide abuse and some of the people have gotten sick from it. And so uh, I began working with the United Farm Workers and became friendly with him and, uh, you know, and uh, spent some time with him. So I was very honored to do that. So that's how I came to write this play. What kind of person was he when you're just hanging out? A very peaceful man, a very smart man. He knew the percentage that they had to hit with their boycott that they would come to the table, whether it be lettuce or grapes or anything. If they only affected 3% of their sales, they wouldn't talk to him for nothing. But if he hit four or four and a half percent, he knew there was a number. Wow. And if they just had to keep doing it, go to Chicago then. Get some volunteers. Go to Chicago. We'll boycott at the markets there. Tell them these grapes are causing people to, you know, die in the fields and blah, blah. And they would go there and pick it. And then like-minded people like me would go, I'm not going to buy grapes here at the market. If there's people getting sick in the fields, forget about it. And so... Uh, he hit the four and a half percent. He hit the four and a half percent. And then they would sit down at the table and they would sign with him. Right. So he's a very smart man, and he was a fan of you know, Gandhi and Dr. King, of course, and used all their methods because people wanted to strike back. He had a lot of people around him said, we got to fight back. There's people dying on the picket lines. They were killing people on his picket lines. Uh, this guy, uh, Juan de la Cruz, he died in the picket line. Nerjai de Fula, these people died on the picket line. They were killing people. These thugs were coming and killing them. And people saying, we got to fight back. We can't just take this. He says, no, if we fight back, we're dead. Mm. And to, the first fast was to, when he would fast for 21 days or something, was to get his side, his side to listen and say, I'm going to do something nonviolent here to make sure we all come together and do this in a peaceful manner. I'm not going to eat for 21 days. And then 25 days, he did these incredible fasts. He was the closest thing to a saint that I had ever experienced. I never met Dr. King or Mahatma Gandhi, but I, I knew him, and he was... Uh, he was an incredible man. Well, let's face it. For the first 14 of the 21-day fast was just to get back into the nice Brioni suits. <laughs> There's that. Or go, the Wyavera, you know, to get in that, that uh, lovely outfit. It's hard to, to get back into. You get to a certain age, you got to make that kind of stance. And I didn't intend to write this play at all, but it, had, it started to get close to 2003, which would have been and was the 10-year anniversary of his death. And there's no movie or TV movie or play or anything out there. So I went, I kind of wrote this thing, and I said, I want to, you know, submit this to the family. And if, uh, if you don't pick mine, that's fine. Pick something. Just right. make sure there's something out there on the 10-year anniversary of his death. And here's my submission. They went, approved. And so I'm still very friendly with this family to this day. I just did it at Santa Monica College. We did it at the El Portal Theater on Lancashire. We did right. it at the NoHo Art Center. We've done it several times. What a great thrill, honestly. It, was a, it, it was, must be for you. Yeah, it was great fun. Um, and directing something that big, that must have been exciting as hell. Yeah, it's one of those jukebox shows. And uh, I started writing these before there were jukebox shows, the term. The, the term uh, is used for like a Mamma Mia or Jersey Boys where you take existing songs and then through reverse engineering write a play around those existing tunes. And I've been writing these kinds of things since... Uh, the 80s and never with any success. And I finally started writing this thing, the Cesar Chavez thing, reluctantly in the 90s and finally had it kind of together by 2000 and uh, late 2002 when I went to the family and they approved it. 
and uh, and I did it, and uh, it was fun because using great songs, songs by Enrique Iglesias, by Carmen Moreno, by Ruben Blades. Uh, I got a Sting song in there, lots of wonderful songs, and uh, the songs tell the story of right. uh, of whatever story you're trying to tell. Jamie, you've got you've been working on one with um, lyrics from uh, Phil Collins, Phil Collins, songs. Go, and Genesis songs, Phil Collins and right. Genesis great. songs. Yeah, I, I wrote so, it on a cocktail napkin. It's all it's all. It's a out. great way to during look. one of my stand-up shows. She She's was at writing, the back of the room writing, on writing a, a musical on a napkin. <laughs> I do uh, But look at Glee. Look at what they do. That's kind of what Glee is. They tell all these stories and yeah. do these things with existing songs, and people love it. It's a, it's a good discipline. Yeah. Um, how long have you been on Twitter? I started uh, myself doing it uh, two months ago. Uh, maybe two and a half months. Before that, I would tweet through another person, through the production office of the Living With Ed show. Right. It was really me saying it. I'd go, da -da, hi, I'm here in Colorado now. I'm getting right. 60 miles per gallon. That was really me, but somebody would do it. I didn't know how to do it. Then, but people know that uh, Twitter fans, the, the tweetosphere, they know that, that it's really you or it's someone else because sure. they ask you a question. You don't immediately tweet back, wait a minute, no, I'm in Studio City now. What are you talking about? I'm not in Detroit. Right. And if you're not doing that, they know it's not you directly. So uh, I had, but I had these wonderful friends and me a little bit, uh, built it up to 10,000 people. But since I've been doing it, now I got 15 in just a couple months. How about that? So it's, it's building. We have two things on the show uh, involving the Twitter. This first one is a chance for the uh, viewing or listening audience to uh, directly ask you questions. Oh, good. It is a form of five different questions. There will be this or that answers, like Coke or Pepsi, just choose one. Okay. Hopefully not a Sophie's Choice for you. I hope not. The name of this five question is, of course, Tweet Five. T5, T5, T5 forever now. Love that, Dave Keckner. Very nice. This one written to you, sir, by at the radio god on Twitter. Are you ready? Yes. Solar or electric? Solar. Roseanne or Meryl Streep? Meryl. Vegan or vegetarian? Vegan. Nil Bai or Mr. Nil Bai? I think that's Bill Nye. Ah. Did he write Nil Bai or Mr. Wizard? Bill Nye. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say Bill Nye. Chris Guest or God? Tough Chris one. <laughs> yeah, that is but the I correct repeat answer. <laughs> um. The other game we play here involving Twitter involves our very own Sam Levine. I will allow him to explain it to you. Sam Levine, everybody! Roll intro. Roll, it. Roll intro. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn you over here for Please, please. Celebrities so, um, have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game she's we're going to play? Some repute. Yes, and she has her own talk show. Yes. Okay, and then Paris Hilton, I'm sure you've heard yes, of her. Yes, I've heard of her. All right, and then Justin Bieber. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Well, then you are a perfect candidate to play... Who tweeted? How does it work, Sam? I'll tell you, Kevin. All right, buddy. It's the game show that's sweeping the nation. So uh, I'm going to read one at a time a series of eight tweets. All of these tweets were written by either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Okay. At the any point while I'm reading the tweet, if you think you know who authored it, ring in by saying your name, which we uh, have already decided is Eddie Bates. Okay. Uh, and then I will point to you. You'll have three seconds to say either Tyra, Paris or Bieber. Okay. Is there a point system for answers? There is, in fact. And we're going head to head. We're oh, playing yeah. against Kevin oh, yeah. here. Okay. You ring in, you get it right, you're going to get yourself five points. Great. You ring in, you get it wrong, you're going to lose three. Okay. Penalty for being incorrect. Okay. At the I end, like it. There's at something the, at risk. Right. At the end of eight questions, talk about going green. Got a little green right there for oh, you. Oh, oh, there's a cash prize. That's right. Wow. There's a that's cash right. prize. I can't even think about how many miles that will take you in electricity. Uh, car. Take me a whole year. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Are you ready to play? Who yes, I am. Here we go. Tweet number one. Tweet number one. Finally just got out of jury duty service. So Eddie tired. Bagels. Uh, Paris Hilton. Ooh, that is correct. <laughs> do you follow? A very impressive start. Do you follow her on Twitter? No, I do not. That's impressive, sir. Very impressive. It seemed like a thing. I, in fact, it might have even been on the news that she was had jury duty. Uh, I certainly couldn't tell you. Your answer is acceptable. Thank you. You're off to a However smashing you get start. There, yeah. It's fine by us. Tweet. Including number cheating. Two. Tweet number two. And bribes to Sam. Yay! We just finished organizing the new art studio in my house. 
Now, Justin time. Bieber. Oh, sorry, Eddie Bagels. <laughs> and? Uh, can I change it? Sure. Okay, I'm going for Tyra Banks. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was also Paris. Wow. Also Paris. And just like that, that's okay. You still, know what it feels like to be on either side of the winning and losing, yep. and you're still ahead. Still okay. Plus two. All right. I've yet to ring it. Tweet number three. In finance meetings, sporting a five year old black halo dress. Vintage, right? Kevin, Tyra. Yeah. I'm afraid that of is correct. Of course. I'm afraid that is correct. It's all right. Very close game. We're going to three points. Tweet number four. Dentist, workout, rehearsal. Ed, Ed, Eddie Bagels. Yes, sir. Justin Bieber. That is correct. Correct. Back in the game. <laughs> Eddie Bagels. <laughs> and ahead. Can't tell you how happy it makes me feel. <laughs> you don't have to. This. I think we know. Yeah. Screaming back into the lead. It's now seven to five. Seven to five. Halfway through the game. Tweet number five. I love fast cars. Kevin Paris. That is correct. Yes! Oh my God! What a tight game! Ooh, Very good. We, this is a this is a speaker. This the barn burner. Call the kids. Mm. Get getting exciting. Tweet number six. Just chatting with the smartest guy. Eddie, Justin Bieber. Wow! How could you possibly get that? He said three words. <laughs> <laughs> Read the rest of it. Yeah. Just chatting with the smartest guy you know. That's all I'm saying. I still wouldn't have got it. Yeah, tired. Uh, that's a negative three. It is now ten to ten four. four. All right, we got two Anyone's game. Tweet number seven. Your life is a work of art. Create it. Kevin Tyra. This game just got a little closer. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> yes. Okay. This is exciting. <laughs> it's seven to four in favor of Kevin currently. We're down to our eighth and final tweet. Should you ring in and be correct, sir, you yeah. will win the game. Should you ring in and be correct, you will win the game. But should you ring in and be incorrect, it's tied. we will have ourselves a tie. Tiebreaker. Right? So here it is, the eighth and final tweet of the regular rounds. Put your all into it or don't do it. Ed, D. Bagels. And I say, <laughs> Justin. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner! Oh, yeah. Take that 20, sir! What the a three. victory from behind! Oh, the you, people. Mr. Jackson. Nine to seven. Very exciting. That's, that's yeah. good karma right there. That's some good karma. <laughs> that is some sweet green and karma. That right there Thank is you how much. you play. Who tweeted? Nice done. Thank you so sir. much. Tremendous. Thank, Thank you, Sammy. As rehearsed. Wow. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? <laughs> is the game that we just played. I want to, uh, can I tell a little uh, uh, please. Justin Bieber story? I was, because I have to find all these tweets. And recently he turned 18. But the I, Bieber. The Bieber, Justin Bieber. And I found, I find that the most amusing present that he was given was from Ryan Seacrest. Ryan Seacrest bought him a Costco membership. <laughs> <laughs> a what membership? Costco. A Costco, a Costco membership. membership. His, I'll like, guarantee no. nobody else got him that. I just think it's so random. But here's the thing: if Holy you get him a, a, a Costco membership, you got to go in. They take your picture. You can't give it to your assistant. Well, you can I don't, gift it. Can you, you can gift one? Yes. Yeah, oh, you totally. can. Yeah, and then whenever he goes, uh, in, they Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. I know Ryan Seacrest can give it to him. But oh, I see. Then then he can gift it to his assistant because he ain't going into Costco. Am I wrong? <laughs> no. Right. That's my point. Right. That that yes. he Justin cannot go into Costco. No. So right. he's got to then Ryan. Can I regift it again? And uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I like that Costco is now selling jewelry. I yeah. think that's that's, no, that's that's been that's been a staple of their game for years. I think that's one of the final chances. To, um... <laughs> oh, look, look what we got here. Yeah. Dueling costs. Yeah, there it is. Thank you so wait, much. Wait, wait, wait. I have to, you... Careful, I, I'll give away your account number. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> you people have to see my Costco photo. It is like a mugshot. But you have to see Careful, it. Sammy says. Don't give away your wait, account wait, number. Wait, okay. What are they going to do with that? Check this mugshot. Yeah, look, look we got, this mugshot. I got Glenn Campbell going on here, the is work. all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of Glenn. I got a Wichita line. Yeah, let me right get here. that up close. <laughs> Just uh, make sure you cover the numbers. <laughs> Can you fix the focus there, Kenny? That is a little bit of um. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> You've lost weight. I'm Look a at lineman this. for the county. <laughs> You've lost weight, sir. Here, let me get mine up. <laughs> I look 
like I've shot. been drinking for a week in this photo. <laughs> Where's the, how am I not getting it up there? I'll go back to that camera. <laughs> it's come to this. There we go. Uh, really, if you are only downloading the audio version of this pilot, <laughs> you are missing out. Yeah, Scintillating missing out. audio. Yeah. Don't kid yourself. Um, sir, can you believe we've got an hour and 41 minutes? Uh, it went by like that. Right? Yeah, went by like that. Just a couple of guys chatting. Exactly. A couple of conversations. Telling all my friends. That's all that happened. Um, <clears throat> I believe there was a couple of other things I wanted to ask you, but start to prepare your Larry King game in the recesses of your comedic history and, and brilliance of the past. I want it to flow. I just want it to flow. Film debut. Uh, there's a little bit of an argument online as to whether it was Computer that wore tennis shoes or Now You See Him, Now You Don't. Computer wore tennis shoes. Starring a very young... Uh, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. Yes. You were young too, though. I was a young man. I got that part, I believe, in 1968. I was not quite 19. I think it was midway through the year. I turned 19 in September. Yeah. So I was 18 years old, and I got a job at Disney where my dad had worked on some things. It was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm working at Disney and working with, you know, Jamie McFeeters. Kurt Russell played uh, Travel of, Travels of Jamie McFeeters, and he was in a lot of those Disney movies as a kid, so I was very happy to work with Kurt. Very nice guy. Right. I saw him years later. I was working as an assistant cameraman at the National Guard place that's part of Van Nuys Airport there, and I go into the bathroom to wash my hands and use the restroom, and there's a guy in there painting the latrine. And who is that guy painting the latrine? One Kurt Russell. He, was, he joined the National Guard. He did his service, and he was in there. You know, he'd been a big star. This was after the... Uh, the, the many movies he had done. He was a huge child star yeah, and prior was, to that. And then a teen star sure. with computer war tennis shoes, and now you see him, now you don't. And now he was painting a latrine at Van Nuys Airport. On his way to becoming a pilot. Exactly. On his way to doing uh, Escape from New York and some uh, that Elvis movie and some other good work. Elvis movie. Elvis movie. He, he played, played Elvis. Elvis. He did. Yeah. He later did another movie where he may or may not have been involved in the life of Elvis called 3,000 Miles to Graceland, he and Kevin Costner. I never saw that. Um, <laughs> why are you laughing, Sam? No reason. It's a fine picture. Great supporting cast as well. I think um, Lovitz is in Thomas it. Hayden Church is in it. John I Lovitz. Courtney Cox. Oh, Courtney Cox. Cox is in that one? How Courtney do I not Cox know about this? Arquette? No. Yes, David yeah. Arquette and we're Christian Slater are both in it. Yeah. Wow. What year is this roughly we're talking? Ooh. Sammy, this is your ballet. Oh, this is ours. This oh, is your yeah. wheelhouse. How do you two not what, know 98? Okay. Yeah, I would say, like, yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. That okay. sounds about right. Hmm? I'm also in it. That's why they're No! Oh. Fun at my expense. Spies, Lies, and Naked Thighs for CBS. Uh, yeah, uh, that, uh, you know, I've had a rich and colorful career, <laughs> and that is one of those gems. Also, if you're going to talk about that movie, let's not forget Santa with Muscles with Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Just to really, you, you don't want to have just, you know, one kind of movie. You want to have all kinds of movies. And so... Every kind. Every kind of movie. But I was surprised that the Tiffany Network, CBS, once aired a TV movie called Spies, Lies, and Naked Thighs. That I, doesn't feel like a CBS... Uh, no. It was the Murder, year, She Wrote, kind of... It was 1988. St. Elsewhere had just been canceled. I had lived through the, as we all did, those many months of the writer's strike that was 1988. And a job finally came up in Canada, filming in Canada. It was called Spies, Lies, and Naked Thighs. And I jumped at the chance. You had just had this conversation with your agent. I said, get me anything, anything. slam. And then, ring. <laughs> and you said is. anything. <laughs> yeah. Careful what you wish, smart guy. Yep. Um, and then again, back to She Devil. Just, a, just can, can I ask about a favorite movie from my childhood? Please. Transylvania, Transylvania 6, 5, 5000. Thank you so Read much. Read my mind. Another classic. Directed and by? Directed by Rudy DeLuca. Very funny guy. You've seen him in those Mel Brooks movies. A lot movies. of Mel Brooks movies. Very yeah. funny stuff. Love Rudy DeLuca. And a very nice guy. And he directed that with one Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis met on that movie. I introduced them. And they were wed for a while. Mm -hmm. Still friends with them, are you? Oh, yes. Because we've been angling to get the Bloom of gold. I'll speak very highly of this show. Here on the show. He's, yes. a, he's agreed in theory to come do it, but now you'll tell him. I don't think I can him. handle it. I'll tell him yeah. how great it is, how easy it is, how wonderful it is. It's a joy. He and, should come and do it. And that there's a very uh, charming and attractive fan. He's a fan super of sexy Jew hunk. Super? Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> he is. He's a, he's a guy in very good shape. You've known him for a long time when he went through the transition of the sort of um, uh, skinny, nerdy, uh, right. big, big chill. Right. version of himself 
through the like fly when the he fly. became the muscle bound. That's Jew. when he got in shape. He figured hey, a smart move. He went, hey, I'm going to be naked going into this thing because you can't have clothes when you get turned into a fly. They've got to be naked. If I'm going to be naked, I'm going to really get in good shape. And whatever Jeff does, he takes it very seriously and he does it. And he went, wow, this feels good. Wow, I'm feeling great and eating great and everything's great. I'm going to stay with this. And he stuck with it low these many years and he is in yeah. He's in great shape. Have you got? Did you ever go to see him and the and the Peter Weller go play a little jazz together? They, they regularly. They're very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're very good. I go and hear them <laughs> often. He's fantastic. He's a great pianist. And will you let us know? Because we talk about going to see it. Let's go together. Yeah. We'd love <gasps> to do that. Let's do it. Uh, Next time he plays, he's doing a play in New York. He took over for Alan Rickman in that wonderful play. Did called he? I can't remember the name. I haven't seen it yet. But hopefully, he's there in June. When we go, we can see him. In yes, he will be play. there in June. Uh, well, you're you're there. I think he's still going to be there in June. I think. Okay. I'll, I'll well, make we'll sure find and out. I'll, I'll email you about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, please. Because you were, I'm from Pittsburgh, and you did that um, documentary. Pittsburgh with, with Jeff. Yes. Oh boy. Yeah, I got a call from Jeff. Would you please, as a favor, do me a toiva? Would you please come and be a, a, a favor? It's a favor that you're going to put me in this movie. And my, my wife, Rochelle, she was in it too. And Ileana Douglas, yes, we all, Ileana. we went and the, the whole deal was, it was a big package deal. We would go and actually do the music, man. Yes. I play Mayor Shin and, and Ileana Douglas played my wife. And J-Mac actually saw that production. And really? Our research producer. Wow. Yeah. And Jeff was great in it, and it was that whole experience of him going back to his hometown and all the very real stuff of the director going, uh, Jeff wouldn't be my first choice for this, and, and Jeff going when the director wasn't around, he wouldn't be my fifth choice for, to, be direct, you know, to direct this. And all that stuff that was quite real, and Keith Addis uh, was very good in it too. Everybody was very good in it, because Jeff has a great eye, and uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, but these two guys, Chris and Kyle, kind of directed it very guerrilla cinema kind of way. It was very good. They captured it. It was really a, a kind of a documentary, mockumentary kind of a thing, I guess. And the name of this film is Pittsburgh. 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 Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent question. Yeah. Once again, nothing from Dr. Chun. <laughs> Hasn't pulled his weight around here Almost since the Almost oddly. Three years. We've been all over the place. You can't keep up with where we're going from Pittsburgh to this to that. Yeah. We're we touching on all the bases. We love the Dr. Chen. Um, our visitor from Scotland, you're allowed one question only. Even though you're not mic'd, I will relay it forward as we wrap things up for any of the crew or our guests, since you've come all the way from Scotland. Okay. Question for Ed is, what's your favorite thing of all the things you've done? What's your favorite movie that you've done or TV series? The, your person? the one creative personal favorite of yours from all of your entertainment history. Why? I'm trying to be fair here to, to, to measure the speed and the intensity and the weight of everything, you right. know, and the duration of the kind of explosion of what corona you might feel is in your world. I would have to say St. Elsewhere because it ran six years and it was such a great experience. I loved every minute of it. At that point I'd been in the business 15 years so I was wise enough to look through the center of each moment every day and go, this might be the best job I ever have. I've had many wonderful jobs since. Sure. I had some before, but this is, I was whistling in the hallways every day going to work and, and doing the work so that was probably the best job I've ever had and I still get some pretty damn good jobs. No, you, you continue to be a six regular. Feet under. Yeah. It's hard to pick when you're in shows like Six Feet Under too. The rest of development, St. Elsewhere was great, but six years, the yeah. duration of that explosion in my life, wonderful explosion. That's to last good. a lifetime. Yeah, last a lifetime. That was great. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank, Thank you, you sir. very much. You're Ross Owen from Scotland. All right, sir. Um, thank you. So very, very much for spending our third anniversary with us. Could not be more delighted. Wow. And you're welcome to me uh, almost 30 years ago uh, to this town um, when we met at the crossroads of the world and my life. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, sit there uncomfortably for just a couple minutes while I wrap things up, if you wouldn't Wait mind. Wait a minute. Larry King. I almost let him off, didn't I? Almost. I threatened him that he had to do as Larry King. Yeah. And then I wrapped up the show. How dare you? Strange. You know why? I wanted to remind everyone, even though it's our third anniversary, we're still not ready. <laughs> Never. Um, all right. This is your camera. When you're ready for your Larry King, Ed, I will give you, Eddie Bagels, excuse me, I will give you the three rules once again. Bad Larry King impression. Don't want a good one. Yes, sir. 
perfect. You're there. Give me that moment where Larry sort of um, gets lost in himself and shares something that maybe not everyone in the world needed to know about him. And then go to the phones that the name of the city is funny sounding helpful. When you're ready, there's your camera. We're here in Culver City sending this broadcast out, which reminds me when I was a young man, first came to town. And uh, I took the red car to Metro to meet Dory Sherry, as I remember. <laughs> and while there, it was still dark. It was so early because I did not want to be late for the appointment. And I find myself talking to a local lady, Grip. Yes, a Grip talking to a man by the name of OK Freddy. And suddenly I'm getting ass blasted near stage five by OK Freddy, who is, I will tell you, the biggest star in Hollywood. You'll find out later what I mean by that. Go ahead, Sheboygan. Sheboygan <laughs> brings it home with always a winner, Sheboygan. That is perfect. Thank you. Uh, can people still go out and, and get themselves some Begley's Best products? Yes, you go to Begley'sBest.com. You can go to Gelson's. It'll be in Whole Foods within the next week or two. Mm, good. And, and so uh, Whole Foods and online. But Begley'sBest.com, you can find out where to get it. Then that's a great time for a timely announcement. It You're is. You're going to hit Whole Foods in a couple of months. Exactly. A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Oh, great. All right, Begley, Begley'sBest.com. Please look that up. Sorry we didn't get a chance to talk about the David Mamet plays. Damn it. The great David Damn it, Mammoth. do you understand me? Do you understand me when I tell you that I'm upset? Do when I, I say that I, I'm upset? Why, 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 why are you saying that? <laughs> He's the greatest. I did several plays with him, and I'm uh, in love Cryptogram, with him. Cryptogram, Romance, and the Gap yes. and the Taper. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Great guy, too. Uh, you'll have to come back. Um, is there some place, lastly, people can go to get themselves a, to, to view a copy of uh, Cesar and Ruben? You have to see it live? You have to see it live. There's We're no going to do it again. No DVDs available, but we will do it again. You have to. All right, sir. Thank you again. Thank you, Kevin. I'll attempt uh, one last time to sign things off. I want to thank Audible.com for joining this uh, particular podcast. Look forward to them and, and more. Uh, they'll be joining the TalkAndWalkin.com as well. Very excited about that. Go to iTunes and uh, write us a little review if you've got some time. Check out the library at Hulu.com uh, for this particular show. Uh, I'm about to launch episode four of TalkinWalkin.com. I'd love to know what you think of that, so write to me at contact TalkinWalkin.com. Remember, Talkin' and Walkin' spelled I-N, I-N. Don't want to get sued by his family. All right. Um, join us in two weeks' time. Next week is we're off. Uh, Mad Men returns to the airways, so we've got to get uh, drunk and smoke. Even for and those eat really and eat fattening foods. and eat really fattening foods, and none of us smoke except for J Mac. It's just we. I'm smoking my pipe. I'm yeah. gonna pull a Paul Kenzie. Uh, please, and I'll by that, him. of course, you mean don't touch the actor who portrayed Paul Kinsey. Mm -hmm. Hey. Um, and then we return with uh, Kate Flannery on April first. Sammy will not be with us. Cannot, cannot attend that one. I'm very. And sorry it breaks to say. his heart. I will be in New York. And then we take a Sunday off for Easter. But check the local. Can lo I vote price. for? Fetterman to sit in. Fetterman to sit in? Yeah. I won't get you guys. She's got a thing for Fetterman. You think? Am I, am I misreading what's going on? Here? You're not at all. First of all, we can't get the two of you in the same frame because he's seven feet 11. I'll sit on like a, an apple box. His lap was the correct answer yes. we were looking for. <laughs> um, thanks to uh, our own Dr. Chen here in the studio. And uh, out there, we've got uh, Justin Weiss, Josh Negrin. Jason McIntyre, Samantha Ward in makeup, Elaine Ewing taking care of the social media as well as the post-production as these find them their way to the Hulu.com. Um, Adam could not join us today. He had a little thing with the uh, vehicle, I believe. Was that what it was? No. <laughs> it was rear-ended. As it were. Welcome to so Show. Larry King. <laughs> I was rear-ended myself. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, a very happy and, uh, and sincere uh, third year anniversary to uh, all of us here, but all of you out there around the world. Uh, we love hearing from you, so please write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatcher.com, either with Ask Kevin or how you do the show or your Larry Kings. And um, can't wait to see you next time. Until then, and for years to come, I hope, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>